to us by, of course, our OG class family member, Mari Morgan. Hey, Mari. Hey. Um, Mari, why don't you introduce your friend since this was your relationship? Oh, goodness. Well, I mean, I don't, I will not do it justice, but Steve Campanelli, uh, or Stephen S. Campanelli, as he's known in the, um, uh, as an award-winning camera operator, he's been working with uh, Clint Eastwood for how many years has it been? This year, 26 years. 26 Wow. Holy years. moly. It started when I was 12. <laughs> <laughs> that explains your dewy complexion. Uh -huh. um, so, and and how many movies have you done? Twenty. Twenty one, I think. Twenty one with Clint. Like with Clint, yeah. Uh -huh. but Not to mention like hundred credits on your. Right? Yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. So they steal him away whenever you know he's Clint doesn't have him tied up, and, mm -hmm. and he's a, a director in his own right. You've got four features mm -hmm. done, mm -hmm. and and an episode of television. Did I get? Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, and. Steve has, this is a, his story is incredibly inspirational because he decided that he wanted to work with uh, one of his heroes and, and manifested and made it happen. So I will let him tell you the details because he will give you a much better story than I ever could. Well, first off, just welcome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Welcome to our little humble abode and little situation. <laughs> I like your setup here. It's yeah. pretty cool. Trying yeah, to do the most awesome. with the space that we've got, you know? Yeah. Um, but so, uh, just before we dive into all the businessy stuff, because that's of course, like, you know, it's such a, a rare opportunity to be able to hear from somebody with your collection of skills, because a lot of the times as performers, we're talking with casting directors, we're talking with writers, we're talking with directors, things like that. And, uh, of course, you know, you've got the additional expertise of, of camera operation. And, and I think that that's a, a, uh, a, it's like I've worked as a session director and camera operator in commercial casting for a dozen years. Uh -huh. And it was very easy for people to come into the casting session and just like, who's the casting director? Who, you know, right. And they forget about all the other people that are helping to make the thing happen, including the session director, the lobby assistant, the casting associate, the casting right. assistant, you know. And so uh, obviously these these films are such a collaboration of so many different disciplines. I don't think enough people, and I'm going to just speak for myself, as engaged as I am in our profession and our community, I haven't had a chance to speak with someone like yourself and learn about the camera mm. department and all that. So I think that'll be really fun for people to learn about. Absolutely. Yeah. But before we dive into all that businessy stuff, tell us about you, man. Mm -hmm. Like, wh where are you from and <laughs> what are you passionate about apart from just this crazy business? Like, what are you into? You got the cool shades on. So like, are you like <laughs> into extreme sports, like BMX bike racing? Yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not. No. I want to keep all my bones intact. Yeah. Yeah. No, exotic cars. That was a whole yeah, other. Yeah. yeah. Cars and stuff. Well, but, what uh, part of the country are you from? <laughs> Uh, I'm actually Canadian. I'm uh, well. I have dual citizenship, but uh, I'm from Montreal originally, and then uh, Vancouver, and then been in LA for 25 years, I guess, mm -hmm. something like that. Why come here? Yeah. Well, you know, it's Hollywood, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's where you come to make movies and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, so, did yeah. you spend any time in Toronto? Because is that, is that the biggest kind of market in Canada for um, TV and film? Toronto and Vancouver are the two biggest mm -hmm. film communities right now, and mm -hmm. they're always fighting against each other. Like, who's got the more, more dominant? Uh, like New York versus income. LA. Type yeah, of totally, <laughs> exactly. So it's the East Coast West Coast thing, you know. But, yeah. Uh, Vancouver's great. It's a great city with a lot of really good. Uh, uh, film technicians and actors and everybody. It's pretty incredible. And Toronto, I worked a lot in when I was growing up in the industry, mm -hmm. uh, but most of my latter life has been here in the States, obviously, or uh, up in uh, Vancouver. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then what do you, what is your passion outside of, you know, this business? What are your other kind of interests? <laughs> I don't have that. So I have no life. <laughs> I, uh, my only passion is movies and mm -hmm. making them. And, uh, but my new passion is directing, as Maury said. Mm -hmm. I've uh, turned to directing now and I absolutely love it. It's one of the best, to me, it's the best job. I just love it. It's, it's a lot of work, as we all know, but it's just uh, so rewarding in the end because you're responsible for everything so if you make a good movie then great you did a good job if you make a shitty movie it's your fault okay so walk you know? us through the journey <laughs> so how did you get to uh where you are at right now like what how did you get into the filmmaking business okay that's a good question i um, went to film school in montreal and uh which one uh concordia okay yeah there's two big universities in montreal it's concordia and mcgill and uh, both amazing schools and the concordia had a very good film program there and uh 
nobody in my family's in the film business. I was the only person to really do it. And I don't know why I did it, but I used to uh, get my parents super eight movie camera and go out and make films with my friend and edit in camera. Cause back then, you know, there's no editing software like there is now. So mm-hmm. had to really be creative and know exactly what you needed to shoot and you know how to tell a story, you know, which I had no clue. I had no, no uh, teaching or anything. I just figured it out on my own. And that was on actual film. That was actually on film, little wow. uh, 50, I think 50 feet cassettes or something. Yeah. So when so, you're saying edit in camera, meaning you don't roll unless it's what you want. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You roll <laughs> and then you go cut in your head, you know, and then you turn around the camera and you get a close up or you do a different angle. And mm-hmm. so you had to do it. And then you'd wait like three weeks before your film would come back from the lab and you'd see it and you go, oh, okay. Was it expensive? Better. I guess kind of, not terribly, but yeah, you know, back then it was, this would be like in the eighties, I guess. And it was, uh, but more expensive know, than dropping a roll 70s, of film yeah. off at like CVS to. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> nowadays. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it was very inconvenient too. Cause yeah. you never knew what you had to, for like three, ah, so three weeks. You either loved later. it or that was it. Yeah. Right? We're very mm-hmm. spoiled now. Yeah. <laughs> so I did that and, but never thought of it as a vocation or a career. You know, my dad, uh, all his life was a gardener and a landscaper. And my mom was various jobs, travel agent being one of them. So nobody was really in that. And then when I went to high school, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And then when I got to university, I finally thought, oh, I'll take a film program, like a theory program, studying movies and, you know, lights and colors and stuff, whatever. And, kind of boring, but I did really well at it. And I was like, oh, maybe there's something here. I took another one the year after and I did really well again. I thought, well, maybe there's something here. So I applied applied to the film program at uh, at Concordia and I got in and uh, did my three-year program and uh, worked really hard. And all of a sudden, I don't know how I became a cameraman, but everyone said, hey, you want to shoot my student movie? And I was like, well, okay, sure. You know, Mm -hmm. so I figured out how their professional cameras, you know, 16 millimeter cameras worked and figured out and I ended up shooting a lot of the student films that people directed. And then come to our third year, uh, I got to direct my own film with sound. And, Is this uh, the one with the staircase thing that I, yeah, guess I yeah, remember? Exactly. Yeah, it's very, very arty kind of film. I, I, the whole point of your third year film was to make a movie with sound, with dialogue, with obviously with actors and camera and all that. And I decided that I didn't want to do any dialogue. I wanted the imagery to tell the story and mm. have the actor with emote without saying any words, have them. To, to convey the story. And then they were like, what? No, you can't do that. You have to have dialogue. I said, no, you don't. If you have a really good actor and you really know what you're doing with the camera, you can tell the story. So you apply for like a grant to get, get as a student, right? I'm eating craft dinner and stuff. And so mm-hmm. uh, I applied for a grant, uh, like 500 bucks, whatever, to make your movie and the rest you have to put up yourself. So they refused it. They said, no, we don't think it's going to work. You know, and Without like, dialogue. Without dialogue. They're like, <laughs> oh, that's, that's sad. I think it's going to. So I had a teacher who wasn't on the board, and she said, you should make your movie. I think it's a great idea. It's really uh, inspiring. And I said, oh, okay, well, well maybe I will. And, you know, again, as a student, no money. I put up the 500 bucks mm. myself and made the movie. And yeah. uh, long story short, it went on and it won first prize in the mm-hmm. Canadian Student Film Festival. All across Canada, oh, so wow. it was. <laughs> and was, that was the budget, five hundred yeah. bucks. No, it was about two thousand total. And so, in that time, I yeah. Mean, that was, so yeah. I had to put up to fifteen hundred, and then the extra five hundred. Where did so all that money go? It just went to you know film uh, stuff. Uh, uh, I music, assume like the, uh, the actors and everybody were yeah, down everybody to just be part of totally it. free. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But there was some. Co- I can't remember to be honest, but mm. definitely there were costs. You know, mm-hmm. we had to rent locations. You know, mm-hmm. they weren't going to give it to mm-hmm. us for free. Mm-hmm. Uh, the movie's called From a Whisper to a Scream, so it takes place in a morgue. So mm-hmm. You have to pay a location fee for a morgue. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, it was a cool concept, and I really was very proud of it. How long was the finished cut? It was like ten minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the music was amazing. I had a great composer. And again, my actor was great. And we conveyed a story without a single word of dialogue. And I think that's why we won the prize. Because people were like, oh, this is interesting. So it was kind of really cool, you know, like to, to get justification mm-hmm. for making the movie and feeling really good about it. Mm-hmm. And that's what a lot of your listeners is like, the, 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 when you get told no, just keep going harder. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you believe in yourself, you believe in, in what you can do, what you have to offer, just, just keep going. And, okay, that's a really... I mean, people say that. We've heard that over my entire right. life of like, you know, don't let anybody tell you whether you can or can't tell a story, blah. But I feel like those are things that people don't understand the deepness of that. Like I've been seeing that more and more just and, you know, even in, in my 30s, like seeing how like 
we should know these things by now, right. but we still don't. I, I'm one, one thing I constantly see is people turning over their destiny to the hands of strangers and not really, and waiting for permission to tell a story and not recognizing the value of creating something or having to create things that you know are learning steps to actually creating something that's great. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So even though you just made the point, can you just share, like, let, like reiterate or just drive home how important it is to take control of your destiny in that way or to actually create? Well, that's, that's yeah, that's a very good point. It, it's, you have to, it's, you're responsible for yourself. No one's gonna look after you except yourself and you really need to take care but of somebody yourself. Say, but somebody but agents, know. but managers. Yeah, no, but you make yourself known. You, mm. you get out there, you have that extra sparkle that they're looking mm. for, that extra talent or something. Because mm. especially in your, your line of work as actors, you mm. get, to say to know a lot mm -hmm. because you know the director or whatever doesn't have your image you're a great actor but you oh, i wanted a blonde i wanted to say whatever taller or shorter you know i get it there's a lot of rejection in, in your side of the world in my side of the world there isn't it's like it doesn't matter what you look like you do your job well as a technician you're going to get hired you know mm -hmm. so i understand that but there's always a place for everybody that has talent and if yeah. you have talent you should definitely Right. But then, and as you've made the transition in, into directing, then you have to, you get to do that a lot because it's a creative aspect. It's not yeah. just technical. Right. And so you get to pitch ideas, your vision, your this and that, and, and get feedback and still have to stick to what you know is right. Yeah, exactly. And it's, as a director also, I'm, <laughs> I have such a, a guilt complex. Every time I have to say no to an actor, I just feel really bad. I'm like, oh man, it's ruined their day or whatever, you know, but you know, I get it. You not right for the role or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. but if you get that rejection, you just got to keep pushing. If that's and, what you want to do and believe it yeah. in your heart and soul, you just got to, you know, just you get a no, you go, okay, fine, I'll, I'll get a yes soon, you know. Yeah, or it's or it's not necessarily no, it's just not this time. Not this time, exactly, yeah, right. exactly. And there's so much talent out there that that talent can fit in a sp certain spot. You just have to find the right spot sometimes. Right. Now, when you were uh, casting um, and envisioning your own films, uh, did you have every role open for people to audition for, or did you know people you wanted to work with and invite them in to be most of those roles? Uh, it's a really good question because uh, all the films I've directed so far have been out of my comfort zone in terms of country. My first one was in South Africa, so mm -hmm. I had to hire everybody mm -hmm. in South Africa, and I didn't know anybody there. So mm -hmm. even the a, actors, even the actors, mm -hmm. yeah. So it was a lot of tape that came in. I mean, I had some big. I had. Um, Morgan Freeman, Olga Kurlenko, and James Purefoy as my main leads, so mm -hmm. I got to cast them mm -hmm. through the agency. But everyone else was from South Africa, and they was I was getting tapes, and, and I go, "Wow, there's so much talent here! It was really, mm -hmm. really good." They were all local talent, all local talent, mm -hmm. and great actors, and they can, you know, all South African accents, but mm -hmm. they can do American mm -hmm. accent, can whatever accent you needed. So mm -hmm. it was very impressive the wealth of talent that I had there, and it was again I got you know five people that were perfect for the role, and I had to come bring it down to one. So that was tough, but. You know, it was the right person for the job, you know. That's great to hear that mm -hmm. you're in a, a market that is outside of the U.S., one that isn't known as like an entertainment capital of the world, and yet right. that you were able to find good talent. Oh, yeah, they were they were really, really great, mm -hmm. yeah. What do you attribute that to? Is there a culture kind of like the U.K. or Australia where they have strong conservatory programs and things? I believe so. I'm not 100% sure mm -hmm. on that, but, yeah, there's just tons of plays and stuff there, and there's a lot of commercials that go to shoot there, and, and actually the film industry is quite busy there mm -hmm. also because mm -hmm. the – the dollar is very strong there as opposed to the South African rand. So a lot of people go and film there. So it's like any pop-up community that all of a sudden, like Atlanta or New Mexico yeah. now, where all of a sudden this dearth of talent is there because there's there's work and, you know, people that come out of high school and they go, I'm going to be an actor. Right. And, well, and then with the <laughs> development of the Cape Town Film Studios, I mean, they took it from South Africa being a, a, a location-heavy uh, country for the film industry. And now there's full-fledged, I mean, they're, the, the the studio is booked out for years in advance. I mean, they shoot big, big projects oh, yeah. there now. Mm -hmm. World class. Like mm -hmm. the studio, I've been to those studios and mm -hmm. they're phenomenal. They're like better better than some of the studios mm -hmm. here because the studios here are kind of kind of old as they've been around forever. Mm -hmm. but, uh, okay, so let's let's get a basic education from you for a second. Uh oh, <laughs> tell us about the camera department. Right, because we don't know. Right? right, you know that there's focus pullers. You know that there's camera assists. There's camera operators. There's the DP. There's you know, and some people don't even know that the cinematographer and the 
DP are that's the same position, same position, right? Yeah. But it's you you have two different terms for the same right. thing. So can you just give us a quick oh? And then there's A cam, there's B cam, there's second <laughs> unit. This can you just describe to us how that that department works? Right. Um, well, it's funny. I hear from especially a lot of actresses that they say the first thing they should do is suck up to the DP <laughs> and the camera operator because the, the camera they're, operator they're the ones you that look good. make yes. you look good. So like, <laughs> there's a first rule right there. Um, <laughs> But um, it's yeah, that, yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, the director of photography or the cinematographer is obviously is in charge of the look of the film. Mm -hmm. So that he or she is definitely in charge of the lighting, the look, the, the choice of the lenses, what kind of cameras you're going to shoot the movie with, working with the director to create his or her vision of what the movie should look like. But sometimes directors, they aren't camera professionals. They're right. writers or they're whatever. So they don't really know how something should be framed or shot or lit or something. So, exactly. So sometimes it feels like the cinematographer plays a much stronger role mm -hmm. in deciding how everything is going to look and the director's more focused on performances or things. Yeah, exactly. That's a very good point. So you, if you have those kind of directors, then you have a very strong cameraman that'll Take, take them by the hand and guide them and say, look, in this scene, you're trying to invoke this kind of thing. So you need a really long lens to really have the audience feel like you're looking into their eyes, you know, those kind of things. So those are the things that get interpreted. Like walking the director through the shot list or things. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you want a wide shot here, you know, and they're in why? Well, you want to see the space that they're in. Is uh, the cinematographer helping put together the the, the storyboards and, and like? Uh, sometimes it depends, again, on like your, like your answer is um, the strength of the director. If you have a really good director, they're really great at doing storyboards and, and taking their vision from their heads into paper on a pen and showing everyone else. Mm -hmm. Some aren't so good, you mm -hmm. know, and we've all worked with them. And so then you have a you have cinematographer that will actually guide you through it all and say, no. Is there an example of a director that you work with that is basically almost like a DP? They're so visually, like, skilled with cameras and um, choices and things? Uh, there's there's you. Uh, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, hire me. I'm, I'm available right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are some. Obviously, people that come from the camera background are mm -hmm. great directors because they know exactly what they need to do to tell the story. Maybe they're not so good with actors and performance, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So it's a fine line. Then you get the other hand where you get directors that are all about performance and dialogue that aren't so great with the cinematography. So if you can find a director that has that great blend, like, you know, all these years working with Clint Eastwood, he's, he's perfect at both because he mm -hmm. works really well with actors and he also knows camera, although he leaves a lot of that to me now because we've been together for so long. So mm -hmm. he concentrates more on the script and the, the actors and I do all the uh, camera work. So Yeah. Um, okay, so we got the cinematographer mm -hmm. and then let's expand out from there. Uh, so the next layer down would be myself, would be the camera operator who mm -hmm. basically is in charge of physically moving the camera. So um, how is that different than the DP? So sometimes you see the DP is actually on the camera too. Right? Yeah, you have DPs that that operate the camera themselves, which mm -hmm. you know uh, saves one person on the budget. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is, while the DP is lighting, there's no one practicing the shot with uh, stand-ins or second team. Mm -hmm. uh, and then so the, now there's an extra time wasted that the DP has to come now, sit on the dolly, figure out the shot, go, oh, we're going to do this, and he's lit. What I do now while the director of photography is lighting, then I'm working with the dolly grip and, the, and all the people around the camera to work out the shot. I work with the second team, or sometimes you work with first team uh, to figure out exactly. And then the minute the director of photography says, oh, we're ready, we're lit, boom. And also the director of photography is probably in Video Village or somewhere where they've got every angle, every camera exactly, going, so they yeah. can kind of run, they can quarterback the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. And was, sometimes, depending on the director of photography, you have your we headsets and then he or she will tell us what, going on, hey, pan to the left, pan right, or pushing a little tighter, that kind of stuff. It's mm -hmm. definitely not as efficient. It might be cheaper money-wise, but it's definitely yeah. it costs you time. And right. Possibly. I think having a camera operator is, is, is to me, it's uh, it's a very important job, not only because I do it, but because um, it does save time. And also an actor like yourselves will bond with that same person the whole time and also mm -hmm. you talk to each other a little shorthand, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, I remember yeah. there was, a, speaking to what you said, <laughs> Uh, there was a show that I had a, a a small role on. It was actually my my smallest co-star on a network TV series. <laughs> um, I had three words: "You two pal." That was my line. <laughs> it's a show called Friends with Benefits on Fox. Oh yeah. And yeah, yeah. Joanna Kearns was the director of that episode, and I don't remember who was on camera for that one. Mm -hmm. But there was a moment where you know the way that she had been directing the episode. He's like, just 
turn your body a little bit like this so I can catch more of you, and that way we can make sure we get you your line, and she can't cut you out later for you not being recognized. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, <that's funny. laughs> so, the, so he had my back, yeah, and that yeah. was that was really cool. So, what you said about <laughs> sucking up to the camera yeah. operator, yeah, it's awkward. very important. They probably saved me my uh, my credit <laughs> on that. Mm -hmm. that's okay, very so funny. so who works? So, Man. how many camera operators are there? How many is there? A cam, B cam? How many different cameras? Depends operate? on the movie. Mm -hmm. um, working with Clint, he only likes one camera operator he mm. doesn't like a lot of people on set and mm. he likes me to do everything so we'll do the wide shot we'll do the medium then we'll do the close-up do the overs so it takes a we work so quickly it does it does take a little more time because you have to move the camera and relight or whatever but we work so quickly and efficiently he doesn't really do a lot of rehearsals or you know we shoot the first take or the rehearsal and um, then we move very quickly that way some movies you will have a second camera person that'll do a tighter shot, use a medium and tighter, a wide and a medium. Mm -hmm. So basically you can get more done during your day and get all your coverage that you need. So, and then some movies, this movie I just finished, we had three camera operators the entire movie. Mm -hmm. And the, so we're always, the third, second and third camera, are always trying to find bonus shots. They're trying to find, you know, things that an actor does. Let, let's say I'm doing a, a medium shot of you, but your hands are not in the shot and you're, the character's supposed to be nervous and you're you're just you know fiddling with your 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 wedding ring or something it's a great tell for a director and so they'll look at that and they'll go oh i should get a shot of uh, the actor you know fiddling with the wedding ring so it makes a lot of sense to have that extra camera set of eyes on the set so mm -hmm. i work that way i like to have two cameras when i direct because there's always something that one camera's not getting mm -hmm. that the other camera can you know mm -hmm. so i stand right next to the cameras when we're working is I like to be close to the actors because all the years of a, being a camera operator, I'm five feet away from amazing performances and, and stuff that just moves you that yeah. I feel. When you're at Video Village 40, 50 feet away, you don't feel any of that. Mm. You see it through a, a glass screen and it's That's just, something you know, that just came to my mind was the, uh, that I've thought of is like, you know, we talk about how, um, how many great performances have just been lost because you know, there was some technical issue or something and we had to go again. And so, you know, yeah, you, yeah. you as the performer have done this amazing thing and they're like, got to go again. Gotta there was go. this, there was that, yeah. whatever it is. And it's like, man, we never got a it's chance gone. to see yeah. any of those performances. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. maybe you could never get the magic back from that one take. So you had to settle for whatever you got. Then you just move on or exactly, whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, being on the front lines, I was going to say, have you ever been so impacted by a performance that it, it messed with your... <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah well, sometimes like you know an actor can bring you to tears and and you're really you know you're drained you're emotional you're it's amazing and when you feel that you know mm -hmm. if i'm carrying a steady cam whatever i'll put it down and take a, a moment to oh, breathe that's you know? so cool it's, it's the most beautiful moment that's what keeps you know it's like a golf shot you know when you, you have a really bad golf day and every shot sucks but then you hit one perfect shot mm -hmm. and you just go ah, i love this guy. <laughs> so when that happens when i feel a performance like that yeah. to me that just goes i'm coming back tomorrow this is we, awesome. we were talking about that i think when bradley cooper was doing american sniper there was something weren't we talking about one shot I, i'm correct me if i'm wrong i think when he's on the he's on the rooftop I, and and lining up there was something that we, you and I were talking about, uh, something magical that he did, not that he, he has a lot of great moments. Yeah, he has but. a lot of good moments. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what that was. I, I do remember talking about it. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, yeah. when you've you've worked yeah. on some films with a lot of violence, to say, yeah. that, to say that as an understatement. <laughs> I know, I don't get a lot of movies that my daughter can see. So it's, <laughs> you know, but the question is, is some of that really hard to shoot? Like, just to... Um, yeah, it is. I mean, obviously, the, 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 as you get older, it's the less violence you want to see, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess when you're younger, it's like, oh, it's just violence, you know, you don't. But, you know, it's obviously affecting people, so try not to do anything that's gratuitous violence. Well, some of the most, of the like, story, like you know? I just spent uh, uh, some time, I can't remember now what it was that reinvigorated my uh, interest in the story of, like, Iwo Jima, for example. Oh, oh right. it was because yeah. I saw The Pacific. That's what it was. I finally oh, yeah, yeah, saw sure. The Pacific. Yeah, that's a great series. Yeah, yeah. oh, but it's brutal. Yeah, oh, it's, my God, is it impossible right. to watch yeah. some of that stuff. It's horrible. And just thinking about, kids. like, how brutal it must be, not only because you're capturing something that is violent, but it's a true story. I mean, oh, there's yeah. there's some, yeah. uh, I, I would imagine you can dissociate from like an imagined story that, mm -hmm. you know, that that's still visceral, but it's not mm -hmm. based on the real experience of human beings. But when right. you're actually there recreating what happened, right. what was that like? Well, that's a great, I'm glad you brought that up because it's a, something I haven't thought about in a while. When we did Flags of Our Fathers and Letters from Iwo Jima, we, um, first day of shooting was on this beach in Iceland. And we went to Iceland because they had the black sand, the same as Iwo Jima. And the, the special effects guys set all these bombs and mortars off on the ground, which is just sand and some cork. So it's very safe, you know, mm -hmm. but still it's an explosion. And, you know, so we get it all ready and there's doing a little sniper fire and there's 
you know, it's pretty loud. We're wearing headphones and wearing a face shield and all that. So the first take, we go, okay, great, let's go. We don't know what's going to happen, really. And I see where all the bombs are, and I'm supposed to avoid them and follow the actors. So I did it, was doing a handheld shot. And we rolled, and we started going. And as I start running towards the enemy, you know, um, the bomb goes off, and I can't see anything, dust and, and cork and sand. It's funny, I'm going around that. I get to the next place I'm supposed to be. Same thing, boom, 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 just going off. Guys are falling everywhere. You know, actors are supposed to be stuntmen falling down, boom, everywhere. And we do it. It's a pretty long shot, 30 seconds or whatever, and just boom. And literally at the end of the take, I, I just gave the dolly grip the camera, and I was completely spent because during the whole take, all I was imagining was real soldiers mm. doing this. Oh, my God. And walking uh, running towards gunfire i mean who does that you can't you know? see no that you can't see you don't know where it's coming from you're doing this for your country it's like unbelievable so this just gave me a new unbelievable respect for the guys in the military and that and, and mm -hmm. women that do this nowadays it's incredible oh, I, I mean watching that yeah. i couldn't help but to just be overcome with how how unfair <laughs> yeah just sending children to go get messed yeah. up you know, oh, like it was, in, it was yeah. so brutal to watch that, but to be recreating that. And then they had to go through it once. Yeah. 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 How many times yeah. did you have to go through <laughs> exactly. it? You know yeah. I mean? Over and over and over. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. We actually got to go to Iwo Jima, the actual island. We went with Clint, very tiny crew. And, mm. there, you know, there's still casings on the beach from, you know, wow. 70 years ago. And it's it's very surreal because, you know, 20,000 well, How do you clean all that up? I can't. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, what do you call it, a national historic yeah. monument mm -hmm. right now. And so... When you see it for real, you go, wow, holy mm -hmm. crap, we were recreating this, but this really, happened, really happened, you know? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So obviously when you're doing something like that, you want to tell the story as real and true as possible because it was horrible. It was hard. And, yeah. You know, we All right. to know our history. So you got the cinematographer, you got the camera operator, and sometimes two or three, like you said, you like mm -hmm. to have multiple. So who, so then is it the camera operator who's the chief of that little team then? So is it like, tell us who works, uh, who's next on the team? Well, next on the team is the uh, uh, A camera, B, C, but they came a focus puller or okay. first assistant camera. Which, and they used to have to do that sitting with you, and now they yeah, can do it by remote they control. They do it by remote now. Yeah, in the old days, the, that person was always next to me. Hmm. So we could whisper to each other. I could say, okay, I'm going to pan over now to the lady with the red hat, and he'd be ready for it, and boom. Great. Nowadays, they're you know 20 feet away and looking at a monitor, so they have no clue what I'm going to do because I'm not going to yell across the set. And so it's a little different now. I kind of miss having that person right next to me. It's weird. Do you still prefer to have them next to you sometimes? I do, yeah. yeah. You know, just It's more of a collaborative effort then at that point because I can whisper and say, okay, I'm going to tilt down and get their feet or whatever. But I mean, nowadays the technology is so good. They have all these great focus aids that help them get the focus. So it's not as hard. But back then, it literally was, you have to know that that person was eight feet away, six inches. You know, mm. like, it's crazy. That, that To me, it's one of the hardest jobs on the set. It's unbelievable. And I've been very blessed my entire career to have really, really good focus pullers by my side because they make you look good. You know, mm. I always say you can have always have bad lighting. You can always have too much headroom as a bad operator or whatever. But if it's out of focus, the shot's no good. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's one of the most important jobs. Is that why they've moved it to being remote? Because there's more consistency with being able to capture sharp focus on what you want to focus on? Um, I think it's just like everything's evolved digitally. It's just got that way. I don't think it, it just sort of happened. I don't think, I think it wasn't on purpose. It just. Because you think you would want to sacrifice that yeah. camaraderie and that, yeah. that creativity to have your, have your guy right next to you. Yeah. The new up and coming uh, people that are doing it now, or that's what they do. There's no one next to the camera anymore. And mm -hmm. It's kind of sad, especially when you're doing that crazy handheld shot where you're just, both of you are in sync, you know, it's, it's pretty magical when you have mm -hmm. a couple oh. of human beings just totally in sync dance, running around yeah. some yeah. dark hallway and you don't know where you're going, but you don't run into each other. It's mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, it's pretty special, but. Okay. The focus puller, then who's mm -hmm. next on the team? Uh, the next is the, the second assistant uh, or clapper loader. Mm -hmm. There's the people that do the slating and all that kind of stuff to make the sound and the uh, picture, put it in sync. So, so they're called a, what, a second assistant? Yeah, the, the most Camera clapper assist? loader now. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, second assistant, I think now. I forget mm -hmm. all the terms keep changing, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, But they have an, another important job because they got to keep everything organized. They got to make sure they have the right takes written down. Mm -hmm. They got to make sure that the film gets, well, film or digital gets downloaded. Mm -hmm. And then you have a digital utility who does that. That'd be the next job down because they're... Digital they, utility? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's what they're called now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or a loader. We used to be a loader where we used to load the film into the magazines to put on the camera. So, But now they're dealing with hard drives and so, stuff. Exactly. So yeah. they take the hard drives and then you have usually a redundant system, which is like three 
different. So you take the film that came off the camera, and that goes into three separate hard drives for yeah. safety. If mm -hmm. one gets ruined, you've got another one. If that one gets corrupted, <laughs> oh, you've got another. Right. So Good. Wow, yeah. there's a lot of data going around. Yeah, there. So and they're big, big files. Big files, especially if you're shooting um, a large format, which is like uh, stuff like 8K stuff mm -hmm. that Netflix mm -hmm. uh, and all these uh, uh, streaming networks are demanding now. So. It's a lot of data. And is it the second assist who's grabbing like lenses when you want to change lenses? And yeah, they usually run and go get the lenses and bring them back. Mm -hmm. But the in terms of that little department, the first assistant is usually in charge of all the other assistants uh, beneath them, that kind of stuff. And then I, I speak directly to the director of photography and the director. So, it's so the, the first assist, you're talking about the first assistant director? First assistant cameraman. Oh, first assistant yeah, cameraman. Yeah, camera person. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. 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 That's basically who runs the department. They order the So that's the not the magazines. camera operator. That is a different person who's in charge of all of the assistants. Yeah, they're doing the focus. That's the same as the focus puller. So they, like if the director. Oh, that is the focus puller. That is the focus. They're the same first, name. First, first assistant, assistant camera. camera. Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay. So basically that person is in charge of ordering lenses. If the director of photography wants the special wacky lens for big wide angle fisheye, they have to remember that, oh, on, on September 18th, we need to get this line. So they have, it's a lot of work. It's not just doing the focus. It's And it's not the camera operator's stuff. call. It's the DP working with the first yeah. assist to do yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. basically, as a camera operator, I find it like it's one of the best jobs on the set because just all you do is it's your name and your description and your name's camera operator. You operate mm -hmm. the camera and that's mm -hmm. all you get to do. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of responsibility in terms of that, but then... All the other stuff, the logistics, all the paperwork is done by the, all the assistants in the camera department. There so. is so much video out there. People are creating content like crazy. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. But like, can you describe what you feel is uh, hard for somebody to just pick up a camera and do that a camera operator who's experienced like can do? Um, that's a good question. Nowadays, it's true. Everybody's the iPhone. Look, yeah, iPhone yeah, with like 4K. It's gimbals like and all kinds of yeah, weird yeah, exactly. Stuff. Yeah. Stabilized stuff. So again, it goes back to what we started with: is is if you have a talent, if you have a vision, just go out and do it. Make your own movie. Do that kind of stuff. Get noticed. Go viral. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's important to show your creativity. And mm -hmm. and so nowadays, I think people can go and do that. You know, if you have this great vision, or if you studied a bunch of YouTube videos, or you're just a, mm -hmm. a cinephile, a movie nut, whatever, you've seen composition you see what looks good you see what you know what looks good you might not know all the tricks you mm -hmm. know but you can get a good basis when i started there was none of that you know there really was no youtube tutorial there wasn't mm -hmm. an internet you know it's mm -hmm. like you have to go read a book and then you don't try and error yeah you only get so much from a book you know and then you've really got to get out there and try it yourself but mm -hmm. um but to answer your question yeah experience does does win over because you're going to get yourself out of a lot of trouble with experience because mm -hmm. as a new filmmaker, you're going to have a lot of problems. What are some of those problems? Like what are some of the things that you can do that others can't do when they grab a camera and try to run? I mean, just even having the, the, the mental fortitude to be able to do a long, hard day of very complicated stuff and not, you know, not like mm -hmm. just the endurance mentally, emotionally, things like that. Like what, yeah. what are some of those things that, like you, when you have a young camera operator, like come here, young one. Let me yeah. tell you. Let me <laughs> show you the way. Like, yeah. Feel like Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's it is the, exactly the things you said. Is the the longevity to be able to do the long run, to be able to to stay all day long and mentally, and because it is draining. Like at the end of the day, I'm exhausted because I'm up all the time. I gotta. I'm happy. I work with the actors. I gotta make them feel good and secure and all that stuff. Working with the d director, director photography. There's a lot of psychology that goes on mm -hmm. on the film set. A lot of it. So that's part of the job, also personality. You know, so. That just comes with experience. As a young filmmaker, you might not have all that knowledge. You might be too cocky or you might be not collaborative. That's a big thing. You need to collaborate. The, the thing with Clint Eastwood is he surrounds himself with some of the best people in the industry. And that's every filmmaker should do that. You mm -hmm. know, don't be afraid. Don't think that you know everything. I still, you know, I've been in this business 35 years and I still don't know everything. Mm -hmm. And that's as a young filmmaker or actor, we just always be willing to learn. You know, yeah. I always tell stand ins that are usually actors. I say, you're doing a very important job right now because A, for me, it's important to have somebody that looks like the actor and stand on their marks, learn lighting. But you can also learn about exactly hitting your mark, knowing what lens. Ask. I'm always telling them, ask me what lens I'm on, 50 mm -hmm. mil. Oh, you, at my waist? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you start knowing that. So when you're acting, not standing in, you know, that, oh, they're my way. I don't, I don't worry about my legs, what they're doing. You know. Mm -hmm. So you start learning stuff and you also learn about catching the light in the right place. So it's, you know, it is, it's a great job to actually learn the technical part of your craft, right. you know, absolutely. What's so. a consistent note that you have to constantly give actors when you're 
when they're on set? Um, it varies with the actor, you know. Mm. Some actors will blink too much, you know, and then it's a weird thing because if you start telling them about it, then they start doing it more. Yeah. And <laughs> now they're in their head about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. So it's a weird thing. So you have to like, okay, don't blink so much. And they go, okay. And then eventually they'll, they'll forget that I just told them that and mm -hmm. they'll just be okay with it. Or, or um, you know, just depending, like, you know, maybe um, putting your chin down too much and you get a little double chin action going mm -hmm. or things like that. You know, mm -hmm. you just, it's, you want to make an actor look great if they can perform that's fantastic they've got that talent mm -hmm. but as a camera person you really want to make sure that they look their best so you're mm -hmm. always trying to see you know move the camera a little more this way or turn your head a little more that way you know so now are you in a position of catching a lot of shit from the director because like oh why aren't you doing this or why aren't you doing that? <laughs> it depends on the director because sometimes the director will give you full freedom mm -hmm. to work with the actors too you know but that's usually their job so mm -hmm. sometimes they frown upon that so mm -hmm. i judge my first two days of a new movie like a director i don't know i always kind of psychoanalyze everybody and, okay i can do this i can no, now i can't do that it depends you know if he or she is the boss then that's it and you're just there to help uh, fulfill their vision or there's directors that love your input like mm -hmm. i'll always help a director that wants input and i'll just say well you know what if you do this it'll save you two shots oh why oh, because then you don't have to do garbage around the other mm -hmm. side and they'll go Oh wow, that'd be great! And yeah, that's experience. That. That's what yeah, you that's get with experience. experience. Yeah, that's the thing to, to have that knowledge to, because mm -hmm. you look at your day. That's a, the, to get back to that question is that you look at your day and you've got 10, 12 hours to make your day and you've got you know seven pages of dialogue. It's a lot to do in one day, but you have to look at that and go, okay, I can do this and spend this much time. As an inexperienced filmmaker, you might blow your whole day on like a two page scene and mm -hmm. you still got five pages to do and it's past lunch and everyone's freaking out and I'm gonna get the rest of the day. So you have to know that you've got this rest of the day. So for me as a director, I look at it and go, okay, this is not that important a scene. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna spend as much time, but this scene later, even though it's a smaller scene, mm -hmm. I will spend more time on that because that's more nuanced to the story, so. Do you feel like you have more time to capture stories now than you used to or less time to capture stories? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, because budgets yeah. are constantly being squeezed and yeah. this and that. Everybody wants to pull the most out of everything. But yeah, I'd probably say less because the old days, it just seemed like yeah, money was not an object. Let's mm -hmm. keep going. Fine. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, yeah, everything is just all number crunching and all Is that, that stuff. different working on a film with somebody like Clint where he has the pull to be able to be like, I want time to really mine these performances or mm -hmm. really spend. Like, do you find that, you know, someone like working with a director like that, that they just get more latitude? Yes, the bigger name you are, the more mm. your studio is going to give you whatever you want. Mm -hmm. you know? But Clint never abuses that. He's so efficient that we literally, we always finish ahead of schedule. We have very short days. Like we'll work eight, 10-hour days max, you know. So it's really efficient on the set. Like you were saying this earlier, like we shoot the rehearsal, which they say, if you shoot the rehearsal, it's not a rehearsal. But you'll find stuff that an actor will do that they'll never do again because they weren't thinking about mm -hmm. it too much. Mm -hmm. They weren't so mechanical. They didn't pick up the coffee cup at this certain moment. Worrying about continuity. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's amazing because you get such natural performance and that's why he likes to do that because if we rehearse it and they do something, then the next time he finds it becomes too mechanical mm -hmm. or if he tells them about it, then they're aware of it. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, that's what I find as a filmmaker too. As a director, I would love always to have that spontaneity of the character, you know, because mm -hmm. he says you as actors, you know your job better than I would know your job. So he doesn't give them a lot of direction. Now, is it true there's, there's, uh, there's two stories that I've been told? Um, uh, one that I started doing myself just off of hearing the story, uh -huh. regardless of whether it's true or not. Mm -hmm. One of them is that he doesn't call action, that he just says the cameras are rolling and lets the actors go into it when they're ready. That's mm -hmm. true, mm -hmm. which is amazing. It feels so respectful, yeah. you yeah. know, instead of just yeah. like dance, monkey dance, it's yeah. just like, no, like, you know. Yeah, just go in whenever you want. Yeah, well, Maury was on um, Richard Jewell mm -hmm. with us and um, it was the same thing. Like, I think she's used to hearing action. Oh, yes. You know, and then <laughs> she was I, sitting there behind the counter and we rolled. And You can you feel know. the camera rolling. Yeah, and everybody's ready and the slate comes in and everybody's quiet. And then mm -hmm. Clint's like, I forget exactly what he said. He said, like, whenever you're ahead, ready. Whenever you're I'll ready. never forget it. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, it's indelibly imprinted in my, <laughs> in my psyche because I just remember sitting there going, okay, okay, now what? What are we doing? And then, he, and then out of this little dark shadow back behind the camera, I just hear this voice, whenever you're ready. <laughs> And I'm like, okay. <laughs> then I promptly went up on my lines. Yeah. <laughs> no, she did an amazing job. Yeah. But that's a, I think that's such a beautiful thing as a director is, and that's what I do also. But again, sometimes actors won't perform. They'll go, we're waiting for action. They're yeah. so trained. And so I go, 
I, would, I like to say the same thing. I said, whenever you're ready, just go ahead. And in all my casting sessions yeah. and all my whenever I'm teaching, mm -hmm. I'm always just like, whenever you're ready, yeah. let me know. You and know? it's great. It's yeah. respectful to them because mm -hmm. it's like, whenever you're ready, you're owning this. Just go mm -hmm. ahead. And Clint learned that from the Westerns when mm -hmm. directors used to scream action. So the horses oh, were interesting. actually, they would learn the word and they knew something was oh, going to wow. happen. So the horses would Jolt. start like, <laughs> like jolting and, or backing up and getting crazy because they knew action always meant So out of respect yeah. for the horses. Horses. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we well, just to stop them start. from freaking out. <laughs> right. And he told them, he told directors, don't say action. Just yeah. go ahead or some other word. And, and so he, he equates actors to horses because you're they're there to perform and to make you happy and to do the work. Sensitive. That they're, you know, and they're very yeah. sensitive. Exactly. And that's exactly what his, his thing. And then when he doesn't say cut, he just goes, ah, that's enough. You know, and it's great. <laughs> well, we were talking about this even just about your recent experience on set. But the other story that I've heard um, that uh, I think is really good for actors to hear is uh, I believe somebody was telling me they were on set uh, of, a, of a movie um, that Clint was directing with Matt Damon. I forget which one mm -hmm. it was. And apparently Matt had come up and said, hey, can we do another one? I didn't feel good about that. And he was like, okay, I was good with your take. All these other crew people, they all were good with your take. You want to waste all their time and do another one? Or That's you want true. to trust us that we don't? And he's like, okay, you're right, sir. Or whatever. Yeah. Like, and then Matt was, yeah, he's such a nice guy. Matt was like busted. He goes, all right, I'm good. Because <laughs> you know, it's true. It's a great job. And but it, it's a great reminder of how our work impacts the entire mm -hmm. crew. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just because the actor wants one, if we yeah. feel like we're good, like, you know, trust the team. Yeah, trust the team. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's, your, it's worthy of doing another one because... And I find that too. I'm like, if an actor really insists, they know in their heart that they got something better in them. Mm -hmm. And then the next take is something better. And you go, oh my God, I'm so Thank glad. Thank God we did it. Yeah, mm -hmm. because there's something in there. But if you're unsure, oh, I don't know. You know, a director hopefully will, will make you secure enough to go, no, I got it. That mm -hmm. was fantastic. Let's move on. So know? did we get the whole team then? So we have the cinematographer, the, D the DP, who's the same mm -hmm. person. We've got the camera operator. Then they've got their first assistant, mm -hmm. which is usually the focus puller. Yep. And then the, there's the second. Uh, assistant who's yeah. usually the clapper loader. Is there anybody else we're missing on that team? There's a digital utility. Well, the digital utility. Yeah, or yeah. sometimes they're called loader also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you might have those other operators. And you have right? trainees mm -hmm. and stuff. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you have uh, people that want to learn the business. So you're teaching them, which is great because mm -hmm. the trainee program is wonderful because it just brings, you know, up and comers uh, learning everything because there's so much to learn about. Equipment, opening the lenses, the cases, and all that. Like if you're going to a cold set, open the lenses so they acclimatize to the set so they don't get foggy. You know, there's so much technical stuff you need to know to be – and that's why these training programs are quite long because you want to learn. And when you get into a union, you, they want the best. You don't want somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. Okay, so. you brought up the union. The, yeah. Now, which union are the – is the camera department belong to? Uh, here in the United States, it's uh, local 600. Mm -hmm. uh, Teamsters? Oh, it's IATSE. Yeah, it's okay. IATSE. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there used to be three different locals, mm -hmm. uh, and then they all merged into one. Mm -hmm. Although the East-West thing, like New York, has its own little, um, uh, forget what it, like, you know, basic rules because it's quite a unique city. So it's a little different from the rest of the And the, the local 600 country. is just the camera department? Just camera department. And I believe... Um, uh, publicists, unit publicists. Oh, stuff interesting. Too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are you are, and so I photographers assume, too? Are, now I assume you're a union member. Yes. Are yeah. Are you involved at all in the local 600? Well, not that much to be honest with mm. you, because I'm I'm never here. I'm always traveling. I'm always on location. I I read everything I can. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we just had a, our president uh, resign because of some issues, and mm. I read all about that. So it was a little complicated. And, um, and then, yeah, I've heard we had a, a, a gentleman join us for another podcast that we did. Um, I think his name is Steve Raish, if I'm not wrong about yeah. that. Who was mm -hmm. who worked as the editor on um, on a lot of stuff, but like right. Larry David's Curb Your Enthusiasm oh, cool. and others and things. Yeah. But he was talking about how that there were some pension issues that the IA is going through right now, and that that's caused him to get more involved in his union oh, because wow. he's mm -hmm. like, okay, if we're down to. I think he said something like 66, 67 percent funded on the pension plan. That it's down close to the point where the feds might come in and take it over. Right, right. And it's like, oh shoot, I might need to yeah. get involved and pay more attention to what's going on. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm always reading. The, they send newsletters almost every day, or at least once a week. That mm -hmm. I always read to find out what's going on. And I think if there was an issue like that, I would jump in there too and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's all. That's your that's money. A lot of you're, you're putting a lot of sweat and blood and tears. So, what is your <laughs> view? Um, what how, what role has not just IATSE, but just the various guilds or unions or associations. Um, can you describe what 
impact or what reputation or what you've just experienced as you've been in this industry? Well, like how do how do your colleagues feel about the union, SAG AFTRA, you know, mm -hmm. what you know, the Teamsters, right. Writers Guild, Directors Guild, producers, whatever? I think they're all all incredibly important and each have their own jobs, uh, obviously. And I think it's important because they're only trying to, to um, that's the right word I'm looking for, um, make the craft better, like make, you know, have the quality people have the right training, have mm -hmm. the right protections. Because, you know, we've all, there's a wonderful bunch of producers out there that really respect all that. And there's some that aren't. Mm -hmm. And so we got to be protected because you're going to get really screwed. And we've all been there. You know, I've been there. I'm sure you guys have. And you get screwed pretty bad. So when you yeah. have the union or the guild behind you, um, you've got some protection there. You've got some recourse. And it's I think it's very, very important to have that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The LA local, it's the LA local six. Yeah, and in Canada it's uh, six six nine and six six seven. Got you belong to the ones Same in I Canada answer. as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, exactly. cool, got mm -hmm. it. Um, okay, so now stepping more into kind of you know your reputation as being an innovator in the camera operating <laughs> space, can you sh talk a little bit about the impact you've had with regards to like Steadicam and just like changing the way people see its role in the capture? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so back when I first started. Um, I wanted to, I was a camera assistant. So I was a second, I was a trainee first of all. And then of course you move up and then there's a second assistant clapper loader. Um, and I liked doing that job. It was a tough job, but I did it well, I thought, and did it for four or five years and really enjoyed it. And then there's the focus puller everyone was talking about, which is literally the hardest job on the set. And I wasn't very good at it. And I said, yeah, I can't do this, too much stress. It's really mm -hmm. hard. So I always wanted to be a camera operator. So I m wanted to move up, but it's not easy to move up just to jump up the camera operator. So I fell in love with the steady cam, which I saw the inventor, Garrett Brown, um, on the Oscars, he won a technical achievement award and I saw him run up the stairs with it and I went, oh my God, that's what I want to do. It was like one of those moments I go, that's it. That's going to change my and life. And what was the, its configuration at that time? It was like a body pack in the over the thing? or how No, was it was a body harness you wear and mm -hmm. a, like a mechanical arm. It's like if you're running with a hot cup of coffee, your mm -hmm. wrist and your elbow and your arm are going to keep it level so mm -hmm. you don't spill. Mm -hmm. So it's the same kind of principle. There's springs and pulleys and all that in there that would keep the uh, camera level and uh, a gimbal system. So basically, you know, it's physics, but basically, and it's Garrett Brown that invented his genius. So mm -hmm. um, I saw him do that. And then I saw the movie. It was, I think it was the same year or very close. Uh, I always tell this story. It's funny. People think, oh, what inspired you? Like The Godfather or some Spielberg movie? I said, no, it was the movie Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> the Halloween? Halloween movie, the very first one, John Carpenter. And he used the camera, sort of like what I did in my student film, to tell the story by just moving it and having really eerie music. And mm. if you look back at Halloween, there's really no blood in that movie. It's just scary music and scary camera work. <laughs> <laughs> and it works. And I said, that's me. That's what I want to do. I want to tell a story with a camera and not uh -huh. you know, get too much stuff in the way. And so the way the camera moved and flowed was just brilliant. I said, that's what I want to do. So anyways, long story short, I ended up buying one and got a loan from my bank manager back in the day. Was it pretty expensive? To very buy? expensive. Back then it was about $60,000 US. And then I was living in Canada at the time and it was 30% more because of the dollar. Oh, geez, so, Louise. Yeah. So think of that as a student. So I ate craft dinner for like two years straight. <laughs> but that's and, how and you to be were clear, craft yeah. dinner is the, is the Canadian version of craft macaroni and cheese. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was very cheap, like you know, twenty cents a box or something. Uh -huh. So I. But that, so that's how you were able to innovate in that space because very few people could even afford to get into that as a. Yeah, back then in the eighties, it was none. There was there were a couple in, in the U.S. of course, mm -hmm. um, and then in Canada, I think there was only uh, two others: uh, Bob Crone and Dave Crone, father son team, and that was mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So when I learned it, uh, instantly it was like went viral back then. You know, mm -hmm. which really there was no internet, but. They said, oh, my God, there's another Steadicam in Canada. We have to hire that guy. And <laughs> I wasn't good yet, so I didn't take any of the work that was offered to oh, me. Oh, wow. Because I just felt, I'm not going to put mine in my so name. So they were all excited, and yeah. then you had to let them down. You had to let them down. <laughs> I said, I said, my name is important to me, and I don't want to, you know, besmirch it by doing shitty work. So how are you learning? Well, I was just learning on uh, around my neighborhood, literally following my dog around, and um, <laughs> my sister driving her crazy, that and just so learning, running up and down my streets with this crazy contraption on, you know. And anyway, so eventually I started doing music videos, and 
back then in the day it was a huge thing mm-hmm. and so i wasn't very good and i told them that i said i'm not i don't want to get paid They're like what that's great so i don't want to get paid i'm just going to learn my craft you know through you guys and I, and I did my job and they were all happy because music videos they wanted the camera to go swirly and go all over the place so i you know i made them happy i guess eventually i felt i was good enough to start taking jobs and i started literally flying all across canada back and forth just constantly doing steady cam so basically it was like a, a western you come in you're like the outlaw the gunfighter you come in you would shoot and you'd leave <laughs> job was done although i enjoyed it and the money was really good for back then is i didn't feel like i was part of the story mm. i wasn't part of the whole movie i wasn't part of the actors it's just like a one trick fun. thing and yes then, that's yeah. the right word one trick pony yeah. yeah and so i i said i don't want to keep doing that it just wasn't fulfilling for me i wanted to be the camera operator on the whole movie and do steady cam which no one did back then mm-hmm. so I, t- I pitched myself to this i forget who to be honest with you but i pitched myself i said I will do both jobs for you for the same price, which is usually different. Like you would pay two different prices. You'd pay more for the steady cam and, and the lower price for the regular operator. And the, that person, I wish I remember who it was, said, really? That's fantastic. I don't have to pay two people. I just pay one. This is amazing. And that's what I did. And that's how I started it. So I was one of the first to combine a camera and steady cam. Mm-hmm. And to me, that was great. The actors loved it because it was one person. Mm-hmm. They're not some new guy that comes in and who's this guy telling us what to do, you know, whatever. So it was great for them. They felt more comfortable. Production did, uh, directors did. So it just became a thing. And I did that. I was nonstop successful for quite a while till other operators started figuring Damn it out. Oh, mm-hmm. why don't you get one of those steady cam things? And, <laughs> you know, and that's what happened. Now they're everywhere. It's crazy. Is that, that still yeah. is that still a core part of how you like to work or have you expanded into other techniques? No, I, I really like I really like it. Like, you know, when these movie came out, these stabilized things, uh, movies or DJI Ronins, whatever. Yeah, because you see that the yeah, person's just exactly. holding a contraption, yeah. but it seems like the camera's being it's operated amazing. by a remote from somebody yeah, else. exactly. And yeah. there's just a, 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 is it the camera operator that's holding it, but then it's actually being guided by It's who? usually uh, like a, a grip, a key, dolly grip. Mm-hmm. The dolly grip basically is in charge of moving the camera for the camera operator. Mm-hmm. So in that case, yeah, they would be holding it. So the same would, one that would push you on like a yes, dolly is yeah. now holding this like. This cage. Yeah. Right? And, and with a camera in it that would stabilize itself. Yeah. So when that came out, I don't know, whatever, six, seven years ago, it was revolutionary. People were like, oh, it's the steady cam killer. That's your... And I was like worried. I was like, oh, geez, I'm going to be out of a job. I'm going to have to learn this thing. <laughs> and I did. I did get one and I learned it. And I was like, but it, it's good for the one certain thing. And then it's not good for everything. But steady cam is still as powerful and as. as yeah, because I got to think there's a powerful. difference between having a grip hold a cage and walk yeah. around as opposed to an artist who knows how to utilize their entire body and work with the camera like one. To exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So luckily that didn't happen. It's got its use and it's it's great use. I've, as a director, I've used it a few times in my movies because it just fits the right uh, um, reason to use the camera or move the camera that way. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's been uh, still city cams hanging in there real strong. And it hasn't changed much over the years. It's the same. It's gotten maybe a little lighter, but not really that much. How about drones? How have drones affected the way that you guys work? That's a great question. Drones have affected a lot of the film industry. You know, it used to be helicopters before, mm-hmm. but you can't get helicopters in certain places or it's incredibly dangerous. So drones are a little less dangerous, but they have, you know, amazing rules because, of course, you know, a bunch of idiots did a lot of stupid things at first when drones came out and then, you know, they crashes and people got hurt. Mm-hmm. So now there's all these rules about but. It's unbelievable. Like I introduced on the mule uh, drones to Clint for the first time. And he was so thrilled. We got so many great shots of him driving through the countryside. Mm-hmm. You can get it in places that you can't get. You can start right next to an actor and then pull out and do this amazing wide sweeping shot. So mm-hmm. it's uh, changed a lot. Yeah, it's really. And was it just like consumer grade drones that you guys were using? Or was it like some super fancy like. At first it was like just consumer grade drones and then you know people got smart like I did with the steady cam. They went, Oh, I'm gonna specialize in this. I'm gonna buy a really expensive drone that can carry your professional movie camera. And that's what we Wow, on the you can movies. carry that much weight? Yeah, you can. Yeah, the little um red red or the Alexa minis are small enough and light enough that these drones, but they're big drones. They're like, you know, eight eight blade helicopters. Ooh. And so drones. that's a specialist that you bring into yeah, operate. Yeah, it's usually it's a team of three or four because there's wow. a, a pilot. That's all they do is fly the, 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 the drone. drone. Yeah. You've got an operator that operates the gimbal head. You've got a person that does just line of sight that watches for telephone lines and things and all that kind of oh, stuff. Oh, that's Power important. Line. Yeah, Very important. And then usually you have another person that's the coordinator between all three of them, that wow. kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's very complicated, but, you know, and, and it's a ex- little expensive, but it's cheaper than a real helicopter. So it's the drone team. Drone team, yeah. Mm-hmm. But they're usually they're really good and they get the shots that you want. And, you know. Where do people learn how to... Uh, operate a camera like you went to film school but mm-hmm. I, you didn't specialize in camera operation no that's a fantastic question no one's ever asked me that before that's good um 
Yeah, I don't know. You just learn it, I guess. I just, <laughs> so there's no training just, program yeah, or no yeah, like well, you accreditation? Said, well, there is a trainee. Like there's a trainee somehow... program, but the trainee program is like literally starting at the bottom. You're not right. really learning cameras. So mm -hmm. it's a very good question. I think you just watch and mm -hmm. you learn on the set mm -hmm. and you ask questions. Mm -hmm. And I've trained just, you know, not really as a job, but just somebody that was very interested in it. Hey, what do you, you know, I just watched your shot. Why did you do that thing at the end? I said, oh, because, you know, I wanted to go. So they're learning as they're watching. So the really only way is apprentice. Either Basically, like doing yeah. it yourself or apprentice. Yeah, exactly. Doing it yourself again. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you know, watching YouTube videos, I guess, to watch for composition, mm -hmm. which is really important, you know, that people forget that. But that's that's 90% of your job yeah. is making a nice, pleasing And learn image. what the lenses are. Learn, learn what the lenses are and why you're doing that shot. You know, there's a reason for every shot. It shouldn't be just gratuitous, slap a camera up there and go, oh, I'm just going to get the actor in the shot. No, there's a reason for it. You want a wide angle up in close? Yeah, that's because you want the actor to really feel that the audience is right there with them and vice versa, you know? Mm -hmm. You want a really long lens? You got to detach yourself from the actor, you know? So Since you've been um, working in a very specialized way for a long time, and now that we've had such an explosion of content creators, mm -hmm. You know, they don't know the rules, so they don't know when they're breaking them. And sometimes yeah. you come across genius. Is right. there an example where you saw something of somebody who's maybe even newer, something that's just like online content or something, and you're like, wow, I actually really think that's brilliant. That's a really neat thing they did with the camera. Yeah, nowadays there's amazing, like you said, content and there's stuff that's just getting thinking But is there something that the sticks box. out to you that you um, saw? I'm trying to think. Uh, like one of the things that I just, that I thought of is like, actually programming these arms that control the camera now that are like able to do kinds of maneuvers, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Right, like, I've seen a lot of Like those robot videos. arms yeah. that are able to capture stuff. You can program control with the remote control. Or Repeatable something. moves and yeah. all that. They do some really cool visual special mm -hmm. effects kind of stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. kind of like the Matrix. Feel, yeah. You know, where you get this really sweeping around shot. Yeah, those are, those are the technology is amazing nowadays mm -hmm. what you can do. But those, those things are really good. Mm -hmm. But it's all about um, vision. You know, and it's like uh, when I did the movie um, Three Billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, in the script, it was written on page whatever, 68 or whatever. It said this next scene will be done all in one shot. So you never see that in the script. No one ever puts that in there. But it was the, the director was so sure uh, that he was going to do it that way, that mm -hmm. that's what we did. Mm -hmm. And it was great because when I read the script as a camera person, I'm like, oh, my God, this is going to be awesome. And then I read the scene. I'm like, oh, how are we going to do that? That's mm -hmm. really complicated. And we did it. And it's a great shot. I'm so proud of it. It's like a two-minute shot in the middle of the movie where Sam Rockwell throws this guy out the window. And mm. it's just such a good scene. And I was so proud to have done it. We rehearsed it a couple of days before, and then we shot it. And I think that was our take four that's in the movie, but I think we did it seven times. And that, to me, is genius. It's just like he already knew that, that when he was writing the script that that's how he was going to shoot that. Yeah, I, I've, so I've got a question, and maybe we, we can cut this part out if it's not something you want to share out there. So you let me know if you're yeah. comfortable or not comfortable. One of the movies that I just saw that obviously has been a real talk has been 1917 mm -hmm. with what they try to do to oh, yeah. shoot the whole thing and the appearance of one appearance, continuous yeah. shot. And watching it, I was like, you know, I, I really appreciated the technical achievement of what they did. But yeah. I also felt like the story suffered because you could tell that they were just going from set to set to set. And it was just more of like a showing off the technical expertise of that, you know, Roger right. Deakins, right? As yeah. opposed to, you know, just because there's value in being able to cut and move and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, since that's so in your space of like, you know, I'm sure you not only saw it, but like yeah. oh, paid yeah, close absolutely. attention to what they did yeah. to try to move the so ball how, down the field. How did they do that? Yeah. <laughs> was there anything, because, you know, the, the, was there anything about that film that, uh, that you, like, what was your impression of the way they handled that one? Continue? Basically, just like exactly how you described it. Mm -hmm. Like, I thought the same thing. I thought the, the technical achievement of it was masterful. And mm -hmm. Deacon's lighting of the night work was phenomenal with those mm -hmm. flares. And it was just, it blew me away. But yeah, I felt the same thing. I felt we're going from set to set. And as a filmmaker, I was looking for the cut points. Yeah. You know, I knew it was coming up. Oh, there it is. You know, <laughs> oh, there it is. So basically, that to me is taking me out of the movie. Yeah. Right. And that should never happen to yeah. an audience. You should never be taken out of the movie. And so, but maybe that's because I was such a filmmaker that I was getting taken. Maybe the average Joe doesn't have I think effect, they did you know? as good of a job as you could do oh, to do yeah. something like that. Yes. But still, the constraints of having to do something like that yeah. just make it so that there's going to be compromises on how big the mm -hmm. world can be, yeah, just for exactly. example. Yeah. yeah, and there's a great behind the scenes, the making of how they rehearsed, rehearsed for four months mm -hmm. before they even built the sets because they wanted to see how long it would take to yeah. get through this one bit. <laughs> right. And then they built the set. It's phenomenal. Like, it's yeah. genius in terms of the execution of that. Is film. there a shot you remember in that that you can't explain? Like how the heck did they get that? Yeah, there's some 
they're like the opening, you know, where they show in all the trailers where he's coming out of the um, the trench and he runs along the uh, yeah. the top there, mm -hmm. you know, and it just keeps going and going. And there's explosions and people falling everywhere. And it's just like, it's so beautiful in terms mm -hmm. of its elegance too. It's just amazing, powerful shot where guys are falling and bombs are going off. And to me, I was like, that was the start of the movie. And I was like, wow, this is like incredible. <laughs> Where's this going to go? And then there's all those shots where it starts on the ground and it goes up into the sky and then it comes back down again. Mm -hmm. you know? And as a technical person, I figured out how they did it. Mm -hmm. You know, but... How about in the in the Jeep? So like in oh, the yeah, Jeep, when they're sitting there, they, they keep moving yeah. the camera behind people, but then you see, and there was, it was the side of the moving yeah. Jeep. And like, how, how did they do it's that? It's genius. I don't know. I'd like to know. But, you know, <laughs> I, I think they, unless I'm mistaken, but I think 1917 won the best visual effects at the yeah. Oscars this year. Mm. So I think that explains some of that. Yeah. Because obviously there's other great movies like Star Wars and things like that have amazing visual effects. And I was like, really? It was visual effects in 1917. Hmm. But I guess there was a lot in it. Now, the movies you know, that, that you've worked on have been very practical. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Clint likes practical. He's mm -hmm. a big, huge fan of practical. So does Martin McDonough. Anytime I do too, as a, as a director, I love practical. Mm -hmm. If I can do it there and make us all feel that we're there, mm -hmm. it's not just a blue screen, the actors feel it, you know, I think it's uh, it's a much better experience to shoot the movie that way. I mean, there's obviously times where you can't do that, and mm -hmm. I totally get it, but... Um, I'm a big fan of doing as much as I can practical. Well, so what is what is your next uh, challenge that you want to take on? Both, let's say, not only as a as a camera operator, mm -hmm. but also as a director. Like, what's a story that you want to take on or a type of film that you haven't made yet that you can't wait to make or the story that you want to tell? Yeah. Um, well, I definitely want another film to direct. I'm working on a few things. I was telling Maury, I got a really, really great script I read uh, a couple of weeks ago. That's fantastic. Is there a wheelhouse, like a type of story you like to tell? No, it just, just honestly, people ask me that a lot. And I go, no, as long as it's good, it's mm -hmm. got to be a good script. And, and I've turned down some good scripts that were literally above my head. I go, I'm not the right person for this. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not smart enough to do this movie. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the ones I do get that are good, I go, man, this is so good. And Clint says the same thing. If you read it and you want to see that movie, mm -hmm. then you should direct it too, mm -hmm. you know, like, or if you have that opportunity. So I've got a couple of good ones on my desktop that I'm putting feelers out for that I absolutely love. And they're all different genres. One's a action thriller like Born Identity. One's like a, a love story that takes place over uh, 100 years. And it's really a beautiful story. Another is a comedy. It's a Western comedy, Western, mm -hmm. not full like Blazing Saddles, but somewhere in between. Um, so there's, there's a lot I vary. It just, the script just makes me laugh or makes me cry or makes me tense. Then I just go, oh, it's done its job. And then, of course, like we all do, we read scripts that aren't so good. And you go, mm, yeah, <laughs> I don't want to be a part of that one. Um, you know, so it's, uh, that's what I want to do next. I really want to find the perfect next film because uh, I directed this film called Indian Horse that mm, did very, beautiful very well. movie. It's a very powerful uh, movie, and I'm very, very proud of it. And I uh, hope your listeners will go out and rent it on mm -hmm. iTunes or whatever. Um, it's Indian a, horse. Indian horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very uh, tragic. It's a Canadian Important film, but story. it's uh, it's here on. Um in, in the United States, all over Amazon and um, iTunes. It's a very important story, a very tragic story, but uh, very proud. It did very, very well. It uh, was the number one film in Canada two years ago. Uh, we won like 20, 30 uh, awards, um, film festivals all around the country. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So I want to follow up that with something really good because I don't want to you know, gonna go downhill from there because no, no. I want to keep directing. And, uh, mm -hmm. As long as Clint keeps going, he's going to be 90 this year. So. Yeah. I got, uh, I got a few more years in me. <laughs> yeah. How about camera operating? Is there another thing you want to accomplish with that or another place you want to push yourself as an operator? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I've done a lot. and Because now know, there's like all the, like, even like immersive, like, or like, uh, like artificial, not just like VR, you know, like virtual oh, yeah, space, yeah. like a augmented mm -hmm. reality type yeah. of stuff, which puts you in the, you know, in the environment. Absolutely, like, yeah. Is there anything like that that you're... I would like to learn more about it. I don't, honestly don't have that much knowledge on that. But mm -hmm. yeah, VR is very cool. I mean, the stuff I've seen, I go, wow, this is pretty impressive. And it's Because right, that's like steady cam on steroids because yeah, now you're yeah. looking through the eyes of the performer. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's you're everywhere. The only thing with, with for me, and I, maybe someone can explain it to me better, is that as a filmmaker or director, is you are directing the person to watch the story that's unfolding in front of your eyes. With VR, the person has so much stuff to look at that maybe you're losing their focus on what the actual story is so uh as a feature i don't i don't see it but maybe i'm misunderstanding the concept but because if you have five six different options that the viewer can look at in the vr world 
then you're really not focusing them on the story mm-hmm. that you really want to tell. So I, I, you know, maybe that's not the right fit for me. Maybe it's for somebody younger, but you know, I just like to tell good stories that pull you in for two hours. That's and, the thing is you got to direct people's attention if, yeah. to really tell the story. So yeah. if they can go everywhere, do everything, then you can't control their experience. Anymore. Right. Yeah, exactly. So that to me is maybe not my world. I'd rather just do yeah. somewhere. I, can I mean, I lost them. so much just when we went from, from film into, well, just, into HD. So it oh, felt yeah. like there was a, you know, a video camera in the room as opposed to that, that separation that happens when you feel like you're looking in through that, the haze of the film, mm-hmm. that beautiful quality. Yeah, it is something. And that's actually, I'm glad you brought that up as a camera operator, just to go back to that for a sec. I've always looked through the eyepiece, which mm-hmm. has been my whole career looking through this tube that goes right to the lens. Mm-hmm. A lot of the younger operators today are operating off of a monitor, which mm-hmm. we all do on our iPhones or whatever. To me, we're looking through the eyepiece. I'm in the movie. I'm watching the performance. I'm in the cinema, on a little screen mm-hmm. in my eyepiece, but mm-hmm. I'm looking at a big screen. Watching it through a monitor, I find you're you're distracted by the environment around mm-hmm. you. You're you're just looking at a TV screen. So for me, I still try and always, even though it's very difficult and I got to be upside down half the time, I'll still <laughs> I'll still look through the eyepiece because to me, that's where the, the movie takes place, right inside that little body that's getting all those images in it right now. And used to be film where it would just go on there and you're like, it's amazing when you look at, you think about film and how the chemical reaction to light had to take your performance, put it on this piece of film. It's just so weird mm-hmm. and bizarre. You know, now so it's, it's almost like an emotional hours. connection between yeah. you and the story when you look through that eyepiece versus yeah. just like... Yeah, exactly. Rather than looking through a monitor where I just don't feel as connected as I should uh, be. And, and like you said, sitting in a theater is a much different experience than sitting in your living room watching television mm-hmm. because in the, it's immersive in the theater. You're focused on one thing. Everything else is blacked out around you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's the thing. Everything's blacked out mm-hmm. when I'm looking through the eyepiece. Yeah. One thing that occurred for me as you were sharing your story about working in Iceland and stuff too is like it sounds like sometimes your job puts you in a, I don't know, like a stunt position. Like a, mm-hmm. the, you can be oh, yeah. very physical, <laughs> yeah. there, that it's potentially dangerous at times. Mm-hmm. Who's yeah. looking out or how are you looking out for your health? And Because if the camp, if you go down, yeah. The picture is not in, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. You can find yeah. another stunt person, you can find, but you can't find another you. Right. Well, so how you. do, how, well, right. Be, yeah, right. No, you're, I mean, right. you're being yeah, counted on. So yeah. how have you been able to protect your own safety and health through all this? Uh, I knock on wood a lot, which I'm going to do right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been very fortunate. Like, I've done some crazy stuff. And mm-hmm. after I've done it, I go, what the hell was I doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, really? Like I was on this motors back of this motorcycle speeding down traffic. And, you know, if the, we were chasing a car and if that car had stopped suddenly or lost yeah. gas, we would have smashed into it at 80 miles an hour. I would have been dead. Wow. But you don't think of when you're doing it. Oh, this is a cool <laughs> shot. You know, then you get off the motorcycle and you're like. But who's looking yeah, out for your safety? Well, there's always people on set that are looking at the key grip is, is usually the one person that looks after you, the first assistant directors in charge of safety. Hopefully the director is too. And usually they are, um, you know, everyone's trying to look after your safety, but this was back in the eighties, nineties where yes, we were safe, but the rules weren't as stringent as they are now, which is thank God they are because, you know, people were getting killed. And so, um, you need those safety rules. Nowadays I find it's, it's a real collaborative team. Everyone's looking after your safety. You get up on a ladder, without a harness or whatever, just someone there like, hey, hey, hey. That's you know? good, yeah. So it's really great. So that's come yeah. a long way from when I first started. There was a lot of stupid things that we did that luckily, you know, no one hurt got hurt from it. But yeah, I've done some really crazy stuff when I look back and I go, wow, that was really <laughs> dumb. But you know, yes. you, you, you are so excited. Yes, you got the shot and you were so excited to help the director, help the director of photography to get the shot and you mm-hmm. do it. Obviously, if you realize, I did the movie Twister, which was a crazy movie in terms of uh, physical effects and all that with tornadoes going and wind machines and stuff flying debris. And there was a couple of times where I felt it was very, very unsafe and I refused to do the shot because I thought I was going to get hurt. Yeah. And so the director ended up doing it and he got hurt. And I was like, all right, well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. That was right. You know, so a lot of instinct and into in, uh, your uh, intuition yeah. uh, comes into that to stay alive on a movie. So I, I think about when Tom Cruise was on the top of the Burj Khalifa. In mm. Michigan, that was, I, oh, I don't yeah. know how, I'm sure it wasn't, it yeah. looked a lot scarier than it actually was, but I didn't know. Yeah, it's true. No. It's amazing. That's got to be an insurance. Uh, <laughs> well, Samari, so how did you and Stephen yeah. meet then? Oh, goodness. Uh, I was standing in for uh, Kelly Preston on a movie called Old Dogs, and Steve was was the camera operator on the movie. And so we met there, and then uh, we ended up working together again on some reshoots for, was it uh, Day the Earth is Still? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, I was removing alien flesh from a body, <laughs> and Steve was taking a picture, taking my hands, doing this thing, and so we've been friends ever since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And a very dear friend, Tim. Maury's a wonderful, talented Well, tell person. us about and your he, experience yeah. working with Mari then. Uh, Oh, she's awesome. What can I say? She's very, very talented. Well, the first, she's, the funnier yeah. story is when, because I, I've, I've done more than, than act in a mm -hmm. professional manner with Steve. My first job was a uh, scripty. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, my first film I directed called Momentum, uh, we did in South Africa. Uh -huh. Great, and great a, movie. It's a fun movie. If you like action movie, it's, it's really a mm -hmm. fun ride. It's pretty cool. Very proud of that because we had no money, no budget, no nothing. Well, that's another one that's it's crazy in the in the in the parking garage. Yeah, I mean, parking I'm sure garage. The, I'm sure that was not as dangerous as it looked. Yeah, and we used some drones there, and yeah. very unusual. When you say no situation. money, no budget, how big was your budget? It wasn't a lot, so. I'm, I'm <laughs> Do you want to say? I'm no, not going to tell you. Yeah. All, right. All I can tell you yeah. is it looks like it, the yeah. movie looks like they had ten times the money. Got yeah, it. yeah. All right, yeah. cool. That is true. I'm very very proud beautifully of that. done. Yeah. you would not believe the budget. Yeah. Um, but anyways, we had one day shoot here in Los Angeles where. Uh, Morgan Freeman, I've run three films with him, and he said, hey, I'd like to be in your first film you direct. And I said, oh, great. Oh, so that's nice. It. Yeah, which is really wonderful. Man, a man of his stature to yeah. say that. I was like, very cool. So we had to figure out how we could do it here in L.A. because we weren't going to fly him over to South Africa for one day. Mm. So we did like, it was almost seven or eight pages of dialogue in one day, which is a lot to wow. do. But Morgan is such a, you know, he's got a photographic memory. He's a genius. And so we did it also. I, it was a ragtag crew. I had to hire all my friends and go, look, we can't pay you, but you know, can you be scripts? So some more, he did script supervisor for me. I had <laughs> Talk about an education yeah, another, quickly. Another friend of mine do dolly grip, another one do uh, all these other jobs. And it was just, it was great. We had a lot of fun. We mm -hmm. nailed it. It was a fun day. We shot here in Beverly Hills. And it worked out great. So that's yeah. awesome. Well, what yeah, what yeah. what questions do you have for Steve that you haven't had a chance to ask? Oh boy. Well, I mean, it, especially like I said, since this last thing I just I just did, um, it's. I always think that coming from a performer's perspective, one of the things that, at least for me, especially in the beginning, thro can throw you when you're on set, especially when you're coming on to set for, for, for the first time. In TV, it happens a lot because you've got this group of people who've been working together for who knows how many seasons, and then here you are, and it's your one day or three days or whatever you get. And you go, and, and A, it's new people, and B, it's the idea of, okay, I've done all my work on my character, and I know my performance, and I've done all the rehearsal, and then all of a sudden, oh, Oh yeah, there's that thing—the camera. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta deal with the camera. So I've all—it's—it's it's always interesting to me to hear from the person on the other side, you know, how that it's okay to forget about that because you've you're doing your job, right? right? And it's and for me being a type A perfectionist anyway is kind of like feeling responsibility for knowing what the shot is, where am I in it, and factoring that into what I'm doing and. And so it's just it, it's just interesting for me to hear from your perspective what what that collaboration is like. Is it like telling an actor just just tell me it's okay yeah. to forget right, that right. you've got your you know you've got it covered because right. that's something that I'm sure you see actors getting nervous or, or oh, yeah. thinking about the camera. Oh my gosh, I'm on camera and what's it? Look oh, it like? makes and, people's brains freeze. Exactly. Up. Well, I I get in front of it and I freak out. I mean, my <laughs> accent if I'm talking, like, oh, the camera's pointing at me, and I walk away because to me it's I don't know how you guys do it. It just makes me so paranoid. I'm like, oh, I gotta get out of here, you know, because I know so many of Video Village is watching. Even though he, he he was my stand-in when yeah. I was on Richard Jewell, he was he he <laughs> yeah, took right. his moment in my seat behind yeah, yeah. the CNN anchor desk. <laughs> it, yeah. it was a good photo. Op, yeah. It was a great photo. But op. it's funny when she came on there, I was trying because I knew she would be nervous because every actor that works with Clint Eastwood is nervous, and so I was trying not to be too friendly or too much eye contact <laughs> with Maury because I was just like, just do your job, do it well, it's mm -hmm. going to be great, don't worry about it, you know. And you know that's what Clint does too is you put the actor at ease because. He doesn't cast in person ever because you walk into a room and it's holy crap, you're auditioning for Clint Eastwood. <laughs> yeah. Instantly he says that makes an actor nervous. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't he's never done that, which is smart, I think. Um, but also when they come on set, that's the first thing they do. It's like well, he's a living icon, it's uh, Clint Eastwood. But he instantly disarms you. He charms mm -hmm. you, he just starts going, Hey, what are you going? What'd you have for breakfast? You know, like it's just that. And mm -hmm. then he goes, Okay, well, you know, you're gonna sit over here and just do your lines and mm -hmm. that's it. And you're like, that's it. You're no other direct. So then that empowers you as an actor. You start going, oh, he's not going to direct me. This is cool. Oh, mm -hmm. I know what I'm doing. I've been I've been rehearsing in the mirror, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so and you go and do it, and mm -hmm. you you feel the change from instant uh, nervousness and to just yeah, I got this. Yeah, you know? and it's great. I love watching that when I see 
day player actors come in, or even like Kathy Bates. She was so beautiful in the movie. She got an Oscar nomination. She was very nervous her first day. Uh -huh. She was like, you know, working with Clint Eastwood. It's like, <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And I had worked with her before, and I contacted her, and I said, look, if you need anything, you want me to tell you how Clint likes to work? And mm -hmm. she did, and we talked, and she she's a, helped her feel a lot more at ease. And then she was great, but she was still Kathy Bates. incredible? Was he's a star there. to the yeah. stars. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, oh, it, it's yeah. unbelievable. But I would love for you to, to share whatever you can to address, because it's not just Mario concern just like you know like the camera you've you've seen so many actors just you know freak out on camera to mm -hmm. be you know once they're being observed suddenly clam up or whatever right. yeah. like do you have any advice or any anything to assure people about the fact that they're in good hands or how to um, deal with that it's it's tough you know it's it's, it's a situation to situation you know it just depends like as a director because as an operator, I wouldn't be able to have that power or authority to just take an actor away for five minutes and calm them down. But as a director, I would if I got into that situation. Luckily, I haven't so far. But uh, I would just calm them down and say, look, we're going to do this. It's great. I, you know, I got your back. There's not one frame that you're not going to look good in in this mm -hmm. movie. I promise you. It's going to be great. You're going to do a great job. And, you know, you just got to you give them that support again that mm -hmm. you, they need and you bring them back and okay, everybody just shut up. Let's do the job and make them feel you know safe in, in that environment. Do you have any advice or tips for people on how they can practice or make sure that they're ready for that experience? Um, I think it, it's that's a tough one because I, I can imagine walking into a set with like Maury just described all these people with lights and people pointing at you and make them hear and people fussing with you. It, it's, you know, but uh, the more you do it, obviously the more uh -huh. comfortable you're going to be and mm -hmm. just, yes, no problem. I got this, you know, but yeah, if you're first time or very new at it, you're going to be nervous and there's nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. You're going to be, it's, it's the way you do it. Mm -hmm. But you know, the thing is, is inside your internal voice should just say, I got this. I'm good. I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get another job after this. It's going to be great. You know, mm -hmm. it, you just got to psych yourself up, basically, I think. You know, you know you've worked with so many uh, established professionals. And one of the things that people erroneously, I think, think about the industry, especially if they're not from Los Angeles, if they're from mm -hmm. you know, Canada. I'm from right. practically Canada, Minnesota. Oh, yeah. oh, you, oh yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. And, and so what you hear about Los Angeles <laughs> when you grow up in a town like that yeah. is, is how scary it is and how everybody's mean and out for themselves right. and it's cutthroat and all that. Mm. But everyone that I meet, especially the higher level that they work at, the nicer and more chill and more mm -hmm. focused on story oh, and stuff nice they are. Yeah. But right, like, yeah. you know, so can you just, you know, provide any context for anybody who would hear this about like w what you've experienced and whether the industry is out to eat you or whether there's lovely hmm. people involved to your, to your, from your perspective? Well, I mean, there's no denying what you said there. It is, a, it can be a very brutal industry, you know, I mean, back then it was probably I don't know if it was worse. Maybe it's worse now. I don't know. But like you were saying earlier, there is so much content. So luckily, as a performer, you've got that much more to choose from. But mm. there are people out there that are just not in, in it for to make your life any easier. Or, you know. Well, and they're scared themselves, yeah. right? I mean, there's yeah. a level of, of ego, especially when I, I worked with a, a, a who's now a, a big director. It was his first big film, and and it was fascinating to watch him. He had a few meltdowns because I mean. Let's face mm -hmm. it, he'd gone from a, a 10 or $15 million budget to a $150 million studio film. Wow. And there were a few times on set that it it just, it, it you know, it, you could tell the pressure was getting there. And who, I mean, who wouldn't? Yeah. I mean, that's There's a big There's a lot of pressure. You, you realize how much money is involved mm -hmm. each day of filming, each hour, each minute, you know. So that's a lot of pressure. So, I mean. So it can turn yeah. some people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there, there are that. I mean, I keep, I don't know, I keep bringing back to Clint because it's literally the best film experience anybody can have not just actors but technicians on a movie set because it is a great environment it's very supportive it's a family it's really beautiful and we've all worked on films that aren't like that and those are really tough so when we have a pa that's their, their first film or an actor that's their first film mm -hmm. with working with clint easter you go wow i go yeah that ruins you for the rest of your life <laughs> which by the way i mean to go yeah. back to richard jewell i mean i mean paul walter hauser oh yeah uh, you know, it was not a name. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he he'd done some things, but he's he's very talented. But it was, his, I mean, here he is going from relative obscurity to bang. Oh, leading just it. insane. He's yeah. so good in that movie. He's so, Beautiful. I don't know why he was so overlooked in terms of the award season, but mm -hmm. he's just phenomenal in the in the role. He's just amazing. But, and I, and I, I meant to tell him, you know, or talk to him about it. It's like, he was so lucky, I mean, I really, mm -hmm. to, have, to have you. I mean, Clint, mm -hmm. for sure. Right. But to have you and, and the rest of the team there, 
in that space and if to right. get that opportunity and have it have that experience as an actor for the first time to lead a, a major movie like that mm -hmm. so that's a good point a lot every movie will do that to an actor will not create this safe place for you mm -hmm. and that's really a shame because yeah. that should be because we're all here to make the same movie we're all here to you know make you know what when, i don't want to do a movie that looks great and has shitty acting in it and i want to have a movie that looks great and has amazing acting in it mm -hmm. so to me that's the environment you should support and that's what clint does and a lot of good smart directors do because you want that environment you know but you're not going to enter that every time with an actor you're going to end up in chaos and shitty people uh -huh. yelling at well, you it's like companies and, that you know, you know it's it, they're either they either have good leadership or not, not yeah good leadership. yeah yeah and depends again as a problem solver on my movie indian horse uh you know very tight schedules a beautiful tough film but we had you know problems every day and that's the thing with experience is you've got to overcome the problems you got to yeah. figure out how to go around it. so we had this scene towards the end of the movie where this guy has got to come back as an adult and he sees his past life and he's supposed to cry so it, i'm sure you've all been in this it's the end of the day the sun is going down and it's literally we got to shoot there's, there's no like because i would have spent time with him mm -hmm. getting his head and telling him what's going on and where we are in the film and i said I'm so sorry, but I just got to go stand there in the water. I'm going to do the camera because I'll be with you and I can direct you at the same time and go. <laughs> like start crying. He's like, <laughs> he's like, what? And I go, I'm so sorry. I was like, the sun's going down. I go, I got six shots to get. I just got to go. And I felt so bad. I go, he goes, no, I'm good. I'm good. I can do it. I can do it. And I know a lot of actors can, which is brilliant because I don't know how you guys do it. But I was just like, sorry. And we, and we go. And first take, he just couldn't do it. I go, great, no problem. We'll do it again. And mm -hmm. Eventually, he got somewhere there, but not all the mm -hmm. way. And then I said, okay, now I need you to drop to your knees, do the same thing, and you know, sock yeah. into your hands. Okay, great. And, get, and it still wasn't there. And I and I don't blame him at all. He's a brilliant actor. And I said, I'm going to shoot you from behind now because I know I don't have it from the front. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is experience. So I did all these great shots from behind where he's just sobbing into you his arm. Tell you the story. Feel his body shuddering. And I was just telling the story, but. The sun was going down, and I had to get, and I wasn't going to get it the next day. And it, it, it's I'm never going to look at shots from behind the same <laughs> yeah, yeah. again. <laughs> but that's what you do as an experienced director, as a filmmaker. You have to problem solve, and I knew I wasn't getting it from the front. Mm -hmm. And again, no I didn't have time to, to work. Yeah. Didn't yeah. have time to work and get into it. I, you and know? that you don't blame the actor. Right. Yeah. not at all. Not yeah. at all. No, no, but real professionals, I mean, and artists yeah. understand that yeah. it's what we we as actors do. It's not just you know you're gonna have some lipstick on and get up there and say something mm -hmm. and, and you're just not reciting words there's yeah. such it sometimes there's a lot that goes into just this tiny moment it may yeah. be a, a fraction on screen but a lot goes into capturing it and, and you watch the movie and it's actually a beautiful scene uh -huh. it's so powerful and the fact that i shot it from behind made it look even better yeah. because mm -hmm. it was backlit and he was just sobbing into his hands you know and just yeah. you could see his body shuddering mm -hmm. and i think if you're watching it from the front you would be concentrated more on his face but so it from supports behind, the performance yeah it supported it actually was more powerful from uh -huh. interesting right happy accidents like yeah that. exactly yeah. and that yeah. happens a lot of movies well i mean not even and and yeah. yes and no i mean but it's also about you know steve has an incredible way of of just be having a, a, the mind that breaks things down so quickly and so clearly that he can tell what's going to tell the story better. Yeah, you know how how to yeah. how to set that up so that it really does touch you mm -hmm. in a very unexpected. And so way. for the sun going down was a great thing because it motivated us to work that much faster and, mm -hmm. and get the shots I wanted and putting it together in a movie there wasn't one frame that i regret it was so perfect because yeah, everything we see we we have the erroneous assumption that it was all intentional yeah yeah <laughs> now this is one of the greatest um the things the director told me once uh, i worked with a lot peter himes he said the worst day i can have on a movie set is to do everything i had planned oh wow isn't that beautiful That's yeah a great it's such a good expression comment, because yeah. there are some directors that get so prepared every shot list every nuance and it just becomes too mechanical. But if you get on the set and something changes, mm -hmm. you go, oh, this is so much better than what I had in my head. Yeah. Let's do that. Interesting. And, and that's, you should always keep yourself open to stuff and, like and that. And take an ego out of it. Yeah, I mean, it, 100%. It just, yeah. What's, yeah. A, what's a story that you have about working with an actor on set um, that you just tell other people that was like a show of professionalism or generosity or preparation? Is there something that comes to mind of just a, a sublime experience you had with a professional? I think um, just to, oh, right off the top of my head as you were asking the question, I'd go to Hilary Swank in Million Dollar Baby. I mean, she was so pumped for that movie. She got herself in such physical mm -hmm. condition. She owned the role so much. She was just so into it. Such a sweet person. Mm -hmm. I love actors like her and Bradley Cooper and Matt Damon, all these great actors that can turn it on and off. They're 
they're who they are. And then the minute somebody calls action, they become that character. Mm -hmm. And the minute you call cut, they're back to who they are. Mm -hmm. Some actors, which I totally get, are more method. They stay in their roles. Totally get it. That's mm -hmm. great. That's their, their way. But she was so amazing to work with. You could just see her performance. And mm -hmm. I'll never forget about 12 days, something like that, into the filming, she came up to me and she says, Steve, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. She goes, um, you've been with Clint for a while. And at that point, it was like 15 years, whatever. And I said, yeah, yeah. She goes, am I doing okay? <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God. And I go, what? She goes, am I doing okay? What do you mean? I said, well, Clint hasn't said anything to me in terms of direction. <laughs> and I just pointed at her, like, and like knowingly, like, yeah. duh, you're doing an amazing well, that's, job. And Why that's change a, it? That's a know? great point. Yeah. And I, again, I learned it yeah. in Mexico last week. And I learned, you know, keep learning. It's like, when the director doesn't say anything, mm -hmm. it's a good, good sign. <laughs> yeah. You're, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're okay. Move on. That to me, David. that's a great note. Exactly. Right. So we're all actors that are listening to this. If the director doesn't say anything, that means you've done really well. You know. Yeah. Or Meanwhile, like the the actor yeah. neurotic brain is like, yeah. they don't like they, me. They don't like me. Screwed it yeah. up. They're moving on. They <laughs> can't get it. So bad. They don't even know have words for it. <laughs> 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 they're not. Nobody's looking at me because they're trying to avoid. Yeah. Being, you know. No, I mean, and that's yeah. that's really. What happens and and what we forget though because the actor world is now all about what self tapes mm -hmm. so there's a different understanding i think about how you i mean i've learned so much about camera mm -hmm. and what the things are that you can do on camera that will send a message that will tell the story exactly. just by the way you walk across, the way you turn your body the way you know different things so i don't know if there's something that that would be interesting to to ask about that relation about understanding working on camera and how just those tricks and and the angles and things really do tell the story i mean you understand it backwards and forwards but you know it's been such a uh, education for me mm -hmm. to understand it's not just about point shoot and get it i mean it's just just sitting into a scene just stepping into something can can tell a story, at, at least for an audition, about how I'm going from one space to another or going from one room to another. Well, there's two things. I mean, there's the, that comes to mind when you say that there's the behavior, which mm -hmm. actors are so obsessed about lines, which is why I love what mm -hmm. you said about wanting to tell the story without lines. Yeah. And whenever anybody says, you know, like, oh, you need lines. I'm like, well, just watch the first 10 minutes of the movie up. And if you're not in tears, yeah. you don't mm -hmm. have a heart. Like, there's yeah, not a single line in those first 10 mm -hmm. minutes. That's a good note. Exactly. But it's, so you, I'm always cutting lines of dialogue out. Right. And you hear things like Sicario yeah. where, like, yeah. you know, Benicio Del Toro's, like, cut 90% of his dialogue. Yeah. It's like a good actor should be able to just show yeah, it to you. Exactly. You don't need all I'm that. big mm -hmm. fan of that. Um, so there's that. But there's also the technical stuff where, as an actor, you wouldn't know that something reads on camera in mm -hmm. a way that you would oh, see. That's a good point. Can you comment yeah. on the difference of those? That's a good point. Well, it's tough, you know, like it's when you're doing your thing, you think you're doing something. It's like all our self-perceived images of ourselves when we're looking in a mirror. We go, oh, I look fat today or I look this, you know. But someone looks at you and they go, you look great. I like to, you know, right. so, but you're always, you're so critical. But when you see it through a camera lens, when you see that performance and you, you just know it's there, you just have to trust that the people around you are telling you the truth and not bullshit. I mean, there is a lot of that in Hollywood, I'm sure. But, you know, you really have to know when it, when you, you got it. Well, I guess the question then would be actors you've worked with who come in with an, with a, a deep understanding of how it things read on camera and mm -hmm. then and then can talk to you right. about the this, this shot you're trying to achieve and then they can give you ideas about well you know what if we did this right or if, you know yeah there are actors that definitely get involved in the filmmaking process and go well if we're doing this you know i, I always look better from this side and uh, you know this angle blah 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 and if we really want to show that i'm scared then you know we should mm -hmm. probably have me do this and, and you welcome that kind uh, of oh thing? absolutely because they know themselves the best right and if i haven't worked with them before i don't know what works for them and usually that's the right thing you know mm -hmm. trust just trust everybody as, as mm -hmm. a filmmaker you just got to trust all the instincts that you have that you've created over your your longevity of your career and, just and education yeah. helps with that right so oh, understanding yeah. more from your perspective helps us just go in and hey, hand it off yeah, yeah and exactly. do what we do mm -hmm. but also yeah. Yeah. understand why the, the shot is set up a certain way yeah. and helps you and don't get, be afraid get to ask questions yeah. too you know if you have a question about the camera usually the camera person will share with you and go yeah we're on a 50 mil and we're on this you know i'm gonna do a little dolly all right i think you should repeat that because people don't feel like <laughs> yes. they can so can oh. you say that again well i mean not every set you can do that but i, I always welcome it. i think you can instantly establish whether the camera team or 
are entitled or have egos and you can't ask questions. But mm -hmm. then if you see you're getting chummy with them, then they obviously are open to that. Then I would, yeah, as an actor, I would ask as many questions as you could. No, overwhelm mm -hmm. them, obviously, but try and learn what's the most intriguing question you have. Like, what format are we shooting in? Is it 235, which is the big cinemascope uh, image? Or is it 185? Is it spherical? Is it anamorphic? There's all these questions that you can look up to find out why, because each thing- Well, and isn't that sweet that someone that's worked at your level is open to questions? Like oh, yeah. you know, you're talking about other people who have those <laughs> egos and want to yeah, answer right. questions. You've worked at all these on these huge films, and yet you're still open to ask, you know, being asked yeah. those questions mm -hmm. and answering. Because it's a, to me, it's a collaborative process. I want mm. everything that goes in front of my camera to be as good as it can be. Mm -hmm. And by if you asking a question helps you be better, that makes me look better. That makes the movie better and more successful. It's just I don't understand why everybody doesn't use that philosophy. Yeah, you know, it's like we're all here to make the same movie and make a great movie. I never want to. I never go to a movie and go. I'm going to make a shitty movie this time. Yeah. No, but I think, like you said, it, it's it's about ego and and, yeah. and there's something that maybe they don't trust in themselves. So having mm -hmm. questions exposes that. But yeah. but the more we collaborate, the more we communicate. Yeah, exactly. In every aspect of life, the better and we again, come out. Knowledge is power. You know, the more yeah. knowledge you have, the better you you'll be at your job. So. You know, you've been so generous with your time. Uh, just kind of starting to wrap things up a little bit. I just had a couple of quick questions mm -hmm, for you. Sure. So number one, of course, is the obligatory for any performers that are listening to this or even people who aspire to have your careers working behind the camera what advice do you have for <laughs> for those that are looking at you and inspired by you and want to emulate kind of you know what you've done so what would you advise to them if you could talk to to your 22 year old self <laughs> yeah. what would you say well I'll, the first thing i'll say is dream bigger and then i'll tell you why i say that uh when i was a kid growing up in montreal uh, I was a huge fan of Clint Eastwood, you know, Dirty Harry and The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. I had posters on the wall of Mr. <laughs> Eastwood and I was a huge fan. I would, uh, you know, Isn't just, that weird how life takes you? It on does, it. right? I had a dog named Clint. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, the best dog ever. And, uh, and it, he was just amazing. And so that's how much I love the guy. Like I wasn't a stalker or not. But <laughs> I, I told my mom, I said, I'm going to meet not work, meet Clint Eastwood someday. And she's like, yeah, sure, son. You know, this kid from Montreal is going to meet this boyhood idol. How's that going to happen? Anyway, so got in the business, slowly worked my way up the ranks. You know, like I said, from the bottom, worked my way up. Got to Vancouver, started working a lot, became pretty famous as a camera operator slash steady cam. And Clint's cinematographer, Jack Green, heard about me. And he says, oh, this is new kid, Steve Campanelli. You know, yeah, he's great. And I did a movie with Jack in China, not, not with Clint. And while we were doing the movie, I thought, I am this close to meeting my boyhood idol. I'm going to bust my ass on this movie and work so hard to impress him. And maybe he'll mention my name. And that's exactly what happened. And he said uh, to Clint, when Bridges of Madison County came up, says, I got this kid. He's great. He's going to love him. He's hard work. He's great. And um, he said, OK, let's get him. And Jack goes, well, you know, he's Canadian. He doesn't have his work visa here for the States. And Clint goes, well, how good is he? <laughs> and Jack goes, he's the best. And so Clint goes, okay, we'll get him in. So basically Clint Eastwood's office and Clint had to sign my paperwork to get into the States wow. to work. So imagine some guy looking at these balls. Who's this guy? Oh, Clint Eastwood. Holy crap. Let's get this guy in here. Did you send that to your mom? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so basically I'm in a cornfield in Iowa and we're starting Bridges in Madison County. I get introduced to him. I'm go, Mr. Eastwood, I'm blabbering like a <laughs> like a baby and just just Mr. Eastwood this, thank you, thank you, this. And he stops, he puts his hand on my shoulder and he goes, Call me Clint. And that was it. And I was just like, wow. <laughs> and it was, did did the movie and I thought, oh, that's it. It's gonna be that only movie. And uh, I'm happy. I got an autograph, I got a picture with him. He signed the slate and okay, I'm, my life is complete. A year later, I get a phone call, hey, he wants you to do another movie. And then 26 years later, <laughs> I'm still with him, haven't missed one movie. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say dream bigger. I dreamed of meeting Clint Eastwood, not working with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't dream big enough. Mm -hmm. So that's my inspiration for everyone is dream bigger than what you think your dream should be. Yeah, oh, Oprah Winfrey nice. says, you don't get what you want, you get what you intend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's, yeah. Yeah, I guess I manifested it. Somehow mm -hmm. I made it work that I was going to. Well, you named your dog meet, Clint. I Come named on. my dog Clint. When you name a dog <laughs> uh, after your idol, I guess that's what happened. Yeah. Well, I, so the, the, I guess the last question that I have for you is, do you have any questions for us? Oh, wow. Is there right. anything you don't ever get? So, because sometimes, you know, you're you're constantly being the one who's being mm -hmm. milked for right. information yeah. and like guidance and all that. But is there anything that you haven't had a chance to ask where you're like, you know what? I yeah. have a question about that. That's something. true. Well, that is good. I would love to ask as uh, you guys as actors is what can we do better to make your 
you feel more comfortable or make your job any easier? Like, is there something technically that the camera operator or department can do to help make you feel a little more comfortable, um, involved? I don't know what the right word is, but just that, that would be a good, I've never asked an actor that, like, what can I do on set to make you feel better? You know, like to, you know, it, I mean, that, that's, that's going to be a tough one mm -hmm. because your lineage and your, your personality, you already, I mean, it's such a, it's such an, it's so easy to work with you. I mean, you, you know, Clint has made it easy for actors. You come from mm -hmm. that school. You've seen why that works. Um, you know, I'm not sure. That, I mean. So, you know, one of my dear friends actually lives right across the street is one of the highest decorated directors from Canada. Jim, yeah. A guy named oh. Jim Morrison. He won six, oh, yeah. six CSAs for. Oh, yeah, sure. You know, oh, really? Lives, I should go see him. Yeah, lives right across the street. <laughs> Fellow countryman. Uh, he's in Toronto actually shooting. <laughs> oh, his, he? Well, he won the Director's Guild of Canada Short Film Award. So he's oh, out there oh, shooting sorry. a proof of concept short for his feature that oh, he wants great. to shoot that's based awesome. on the story of Sam Langford, the best boxer no one's ever oh, heard yeah. about in Nova right. Scotia. Yeah, yeah. Who won all these con mm -hmm. contests yeah. uh, blind. Um, yeah, championships, yeah, blind incredible. boxer, punching above his weight class. Anyway, um, it's a great story, yeah. but Jim said, yeah, amazing story. Mm -hmm. So Jim, that's his passion project. He, he told me that one of the most important people he likes to hand select on every set is the makeup artist. Oh. Because they're the first person mm -hmm. that the actor is going to be that's interacting so with when they yeah. get to set. And mm -hmm. if you have a shitty makeup artist who's like cranky and this or that, Train. then that's their introduction to the energy of the set. But if right. they're lovely and warm, it puts the performer at ease and makes them feel warm and welcome. Yeah. So good. I think, you know, just you asking the question that you mm -hmm. just did mm -hmm. shows that that you run sets that people are well taken care of mm -hmm. and that they're going to have a good experience. Right, yeah. um, and because if that's where your attention is on, then chances are that's what you focus on. Right. And that's what I tell people is people who are afraid of being like, am I polite enough? You're probably the most polite person because that's where your attention <laughs> yeah, is. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So, it's a Canadian thing. So <laughs> I guess the, the, the answer that I would have to the question is what can we do better is I guess you know, the fact that you are willing to come and do this and share your expertise yeah, uh, for pleasure. people who do what you do, for them to know that, you know, they can work at the level that you work at and be the most generous mm -hmm. and kind and open and communicative person. Because I don't think anybody can listen to what you've just shared with us over this last hour and a half and right. not come away thinking like, I would love to work with someone like that because mm -hmm. it's already scary enough to step onto a yeah, set. Sure. And you're there for such a brief period of time. You know, you, you may work for years and years and years to have three days on a film or something. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, and that's, yeah. it. That's, yeah, that's it. That's yeah, it. That's it. Right. You get to be there every day, but yeah. a lot of performers are in there for a day or two or that's three more. And then there's six months in between and you just, yeah. yeah. So, so to know that, you know, that, that what, what I hope is that other, that you can do more things to help other people learn from the example that you set, mm -hmm. like to, to, to share that. your perspective. So other people know that, Hey, we have, we're all on the same team. Yeah. The, the person behind the camera is not part of the Borg that's against you. Like mm -hmm. they right. are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. We're all going to make the same movie. I never right. got that thing where, you know, it was us versus them. It's like completely the opposite it should be. We should collaborate. We should have fun. We should have a great rap party, you know. Well, what can <laughs> we do to support you? So definitely going to watch Indian Horse. Yes, please watch Indian Momentum. Horse. Momentum's a lot of fun. So yes, what else is. can we do to support anything that you've done, are uh, doing? That's a great – well, when I uh, – when I – Call for cast auditions for my next movie. Just everybody <laughs> come on out. <laughs> oh God! Let's see what happens. Yeah, uh -huh. um, I don't know. Just uh, yeah, just a lot of making on Instagram. movies. And, yeah, exactly. Or so if people wanted to hire you, yeah. so if you're in between projects, like how yeah. do people reach out to to? Uh, on my IMDb, I have my email. My direct mm -hmm. email is there. So if people want to, you know, send me scripts or say mm -hmm. hello or uh, say, hey, I just saw your movie Indian Horse and loved it. <laughs> want to share it with the world. Uh, because it didn't get the proper promotion here in the States that it should have. And yeah. it, uh, I would love for people to see it and spread the word because it is a very, not just because I did it, it's a very powerful movie. Yeah. And it's a very important story that people should try and share as much as possible. All right. You uh, all have your marching orders. Yeah, please out uh, there. Thank you Thank so you, Mari, for bringing Steve in for us to have a conversation. It was the first name she had. And she's like, oh, I'm going to get my friend Steve. Sure. Yeah, it's very and sweet. Thank, thank you Maury. for making the time. And it's such an honor to hear from you. And congratulations on such an accomplished career. You can't wait to see you create a you know, hundred more films. Oh, I appreciate that, Sean. Thank <laughs> and, you so and much. And he will, too. Really <laughs> nice meeting you.